Chapter 5. Parties. Modern procedural rules make available several devices for joinder of parties beyond the single plaintiff vs. single defendant paradigm of a lawsuit. The standards for joinder vary with the functions served by the various procedural devices. When you face a problem involving more than just one plaintiff vs. one defendant, consider the following. 1. Before you even get to joinder issues, you may need to think about the requirements of real party in interest and capacity to sue or be sued. A. Is the action brought in the name of the real party in interest, i.e., the party who has the right to enforce the claim under governing substantive law? B. Do the parties have legal competence to be parties to a lawsuit? Do they have capacity to sue or be sued? Partnerships as opposed to partners and infants, an incompetent person, for example, may lack legal capacity. 2. If the situation in your question calls for joinder of someone not a party to the suit, is joinder compulsory? A. Would failure to join the absentee prevent the granting of complete relief or prejudice his or the present party's interests? If so, he should be joined if joinder is feasible. If it is not feasible as when joinder would destroy complete diversity in a diversity case in federal court, the court must decide whether it can proceed with only the present parties before it. 1. If the court can proceed, the absentee is characterized as merely a necessary party, and the action can proceed in his absence. 2. If the court cannot proceed, the absentee is regarded as an indispensable party and the action must be dismissed. 3. To determine whether permissive joinder is appropriate, consider a. Is the relief sought jointly, severally, or in the alternative? b. Does the claim arise out of the same transaction or series of transactions? and c. Is there a common question of law or fact? 4. Sometimes someone not already a party to the suit seeks to intervene. In that case consider a. Is the case one for intervention of right, in which disposition in his absence could impair or impede his ability to protect an interest he claims in the property or transaction sued on, and the existing parties do not adequately represent his interest? b. Is the case one in which the court may allow permissive intervention, with the prospective interventor's claim or defense having a question of law or fact in common with the main action. 5. When you see facts that have two or more persons asserting a claim to money or property in the hands of a third party the stakeholder, think of interpleader. The stakeholder may deposit the property with the court and seek a ruling as to which of the adverse claimants is entitled to the property. 6. A defendant in your question may seek impleader of a third party defendant. If so, is the third party e.g. an insurer one who is or may be liable to the defendant for all or part of the plaintiff's claim against the defendant? 7. In federal court, when an effort is made at adding a party, if there is no independent basis of federal jurisdiction, think about whether there is supplemental jurisdiction over the added claim or for a claim against the additional party. 8. If the situation seems to call for a class action, a. Ask. 1. Are the class members so numerous that joinder of all is impracticable? 2. Are there common questions of law or fact? 3. Are the representative's claims or defenses typical of those of the class? And 4. Will the representative adequately represent the interests of the class? B. And in addition, ask. 1. Might there be prejudice from separate actions? 2. Has the class's opponent acted or refused to act on grounds generally applicable to the class, making class-wide injunctive or declaratory relief appropriate? Or 3. Do common questions predominate over individual ones and is a class action superior to other methods? C. If you find that the case may be conducted as a class action, has required notice. Been given? D. 
If a proposed settlement has been reached in a case filed as a class action, and it seeks to resolve class claims or defenses, ask. 1. Has appropriate notice of the proposed settlement been given to members of the class? 2. Have any objections to the proposed settlement been submitted by members of the class? And 3. Have the proponents of the proposed settlement demonstrated that it is fair, reasonable, and adequate? A. Real Party in Interest Rule 1. Background 1E25 At common law, only the legal owner of a right could bring an action for infringement of that right. Since the common law did not recognize equitable interests e.g. rights of subrogies, beneficiaries of various kinds of trusts, etc., the holder of such an interest could not sue at law for its enforcement, but instead had to rely on the legal owner to bring suit. This burdensome practice has been abolished, and today, suit can be brought only in the name of the real party in interest. Fed. R. Civ. P. 17. 2. Definition 1E26 The real party in interest rule has two parts. The person who is suing must. I use her own name as plaintiff. And Roman II have a legal right to enforce the claim in question under the applicable substantive law. A. Exception permission to sue using fictitious name 1E27. In limited circumstances, a court may permit a plaintiff to proceed under a fictitious name, such as Jane Doe, to protect against serious harm that would result from revealing the party's name. However, this is allowed only if the plaintiff shows a compelling need to proceed anonymously. C. E.G. Southern Methodist University Association of Women Law Students v. Wynn and Jaff, 599 F2D 707 5th Sir, 1979 Female Lawyers, asserting that law firm discriminated against women, could not proceed anonymously. B. Burden of Proof 128 The plaintiff has the burden of proving that she is a real party in interest, i.e., that she should be allowed to sue to protect the interest involved. C. Under Federal Rules and State Rules 1E29, the following parties have a right to sue as representative parties even though they may have no beneficial interest in the claims at issue fed. R. Civ. P. 17a. 1. The executor, administrator, guardian, or trustee of an estate. 2. A party to a contract made for the benefit of another party e.g. an agent contracting on behalf of the principal or the promisee of a third-party beneficiary contract. And 3. A private claimant suing in the name of the United States government, if such a claim is expressly authorized by statute. D. In all other cases 1030. In all other cases, a determination of the real party in interest is made according to applicable substantive law. In a federal diversity action, the applicable state law is applied. 3. Determination of real party in interest 1031. The following situations illustrate the types of problems encountered in determining the real party in interest. A. Assignments 1032. Whether an assignee is the real party in interest depends primarily on the nature of the assignment. 1. Complete Assignment 1033. If the assignor's entire interest has been transferred to the assignee, the assignee has become the real party in interest. The assignee may then prosecute any action to enforce the assigned right in her own name without joining the assignor. A. Gratuitous Assignment 1034 In state and federal practice, the assignee can sue even if she paid nothing for the claim and is merely an assignee for collection. However, in federal court, the citizenship of the assignor determines whether diversity exists. C. Supra 356 Assignment after commencement of suit 1035. If the assignment takes place after suit has been filed, the assignee may either continue the action in the name of the assignor or be substituted as the plaintiff. C. Fed. R. Civ. P. 25 C. C. Effective judgment 1036. A judgment in the assignee's action 
will bar any subsequent suit on the same claim by the Asinor. Because of the privity between the Asini and Asinor. Nemeth v. Hare, 146 Cal. App. 2D 405 1956. And see discussion on res judicata, infra, 2263 at sec. 2. Partial Assignments, 1037. At common law, the assignee of part of a claim could not enforce the claim at all. However, partial assignees could enforce their claims in equity if the assignor and all other partial assignees joined as parties in the same suit. A. Modern Rule 1038. Today, the assignor and all partial assignees are considered necessary parties in any suit to enforce the claim, and on appropriate motion, the court will order their joinder. United States v. Eaton a Casualty and Surety Co., 338 U.S., 366 1949. 3. Assignment may create diversity 1039. When an assignee seeks to base federal court subject matter jurisdiction on diversity of citizenship, and there was no diversity between the assignor and the defendant, jurisdiction exists only if substantial consideration was given for the assignment. C. Supra, 356. B. Subrogation, 1040. Subrogation is an equitable principle through which an assignment occurs by operation of law. Under the doctrine of subrogation, the person who pays another for a loss or injury caused by the act of some third person is entitled to enforce whatever claim the injured person had against the third person. Most jurisdictions allow the person who paid subrogy to sue in his own name without joining the injured party subrogger. United States v. Eatna Casualty and Surety Co. Supra Example Insurance Co. Insures plaintiff's house and pays plaintiff for damages to the house caused in a fire. Insurance Co. Becomes subrogated to plaintiff's claims for fire damage to the house and is entitled to sue plaintiff's neighbors on the theory that they were responsible for the fire damage to plaintiff's house. State Farm General Insurance Co. v. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., 143 Cal, App, 4th, 1998, 2006. 1. Tactical Problem, 1041. An insurance company will usually prefer to sue in the name of its insured, rather than in its own name, to avoid any jury prejudice against insurers. Consequently, most insurance settlements contain provisions expressly authorizing the insurer to sue the wrongdoer in the name of the insured. A. Note. The traditional view did not permit such suits because the insured, having been fully paid and having assigned the claim to the company, had no further interest in the matter. C. Sosno v. Sturati Corp. 295 NY. 675 1946 However, most states now permit suits in the name of the insured. C. Bakowski v. Mountain States Steel, Inc. 52 P3D 1 He 79 Utah 22. B. End note. Even states that do not permit suit in the name of the insured may recognize the loan receipt device. Here, the insurer instead of paying off the insured makes him a loan repayable only out of proceeds from the insured's recovery against the third person. The insured gets his money, but still owns the claim. The insurance company then brings suit in the name of the insured, and the insurer keeps the proceeds if it wins. C. Trusts. 1. Trustee 1042. The trustee of a trust holds legal title to the trust estate and is therefore the real party and in interest for redress of any wrong to the trust estate. Fed. R. Civ. P. 17 suit is maintained in the trustee's name as trustee e.g. John Smith, as trustee of the Mary Doe Trust. Moeller v. Superior Court, 16 Cal. 4th, 22 and 24, 1997. 2. Beneficiary 1043. The beneficiary of a trust may sue the trustee to protect her rights, as beneficiary e.g., for an accounting, for distributions of assets, etc. Harnity v. Witty, 110 Cal. App. 4th, 1333, 2003. A. But note. 
A beneficiary cannot sue third persons for wrongs to the trust estate unless the trustee refuses to bring suit for such injuries. In the latter situation, the beneficiary can sue the third party by joining the trustee and alleging his failure to act. Sachs v. Damon Rake & Co. 7 Cal. App. 4 419-1992. D. Executors and Administrators 1944. Executors and Administrators are the proper parties to sue on behalf of decedents' estates at law or in equity. 2. State of Appointment 1345. Problems do arise about the capacity of a representative appointed in one state to sue in another. But such problems do not result from the real party in interest provision. They concern primarily the policy of the forum state of protecting local creditors. This has led to the general rule that an executor or administrator has capacity to sue only in the state of her appointment, unless she obtains ancillary appointment in another state. 2. Beneficiary of an estate pursuing claims 1046. Ordinarily, the legatee or distributee of an estate may not bring suit to pursue claims of the estate, although exceptions have been recognized in situations parallel to the exceptions for beneficiaries of a trust. 3. Survival Statutes and Wrongful Death Acts 1047 Claims under survival statutes are generally part of the decedent's estate and are to be pursued by his executor or administrator just as any other asset of the estate would be. Wrongful death acts generally specify the proper party to an action under them. Some of them name one or more of the beneficiaries, and in such a case, the party named is, of course, the real party in interest. Many of them require suit to be brought by the personal representative of the deceased i.e., the executor or administrator. However, when suing under such a statute, the executor or administrator is not acting as a representative of the estate but rather as a person designated by statute. Consequently, the judgment or recovery under the statute will not be an asset of the estate at all, but instead will belong to the statutory beneficiaries, who may or may not be the same persons who would take as legatees or distributees of the estate. e. Principal and Agent 1048 If a contract has been executed by an agent acting for a principal, the following rules apply. 1. If the obligation is owed to the principal alone, the principal is the only proper plaintiff. 2. If the obligation is owed to both the agent and the principal, either party may sue e.g. if there was a promise to both the agent and the principal. Warren Insurance Agency v. Surpour Timber Co. 250 Cal. App. 2D 1967 Suit by Agent. Ford v. Williams. 62 U.S. 287 1858 suit by undisclosed principal. F. Third party beneficiary 1949. If a third party beneficiary has enforceable rights under a contract, he is the real party in interest and is entitled to sue in his own name to enforce his rights. Or cut v. Farinini, 237 Cal. App. 2D 216 1965. 1. Rights of Promisee 1050 The promisee under a contract may also be entitled to sue to enforce the promise given for the benefit of a third party. In such case, both the promisee and the third party beneficiary would have enforceable rights and would be deemed real parties in interest. 4. Attacking Violation of Real Party in Interest Rule a. If Defect Apparent 1. Federal Practice 1051 If a violation of the real party in interest rule is apparent on the face of a complaint in federal court, the defendant should make a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which relief may be granted since the plaintiff has no right to recovery. Fed. R. Civ. P. 12b6. 2. Code Practice Some States 1052 Under Code Pleading Practice a general demur is appropriate to attack defects on the face of the complaint. C. Supra, 738. B. Where defect not apparent 1053. If the defect is not apparent on the face of the complaint, 
The defendant may move for summary judgment supported by appropriate affidavits to establish the defect, or may raise the matter as an affirmative defense in her answer. 5. Non-joinder of Necessary Party 1054 If the named plaintiff has some kind of interest in the claim a signor or assignee, principal or agent, trustee or beneficiary, and the objection is that someone else should also be the named plaintiff, another partial assignee, principal, etc. This is an objection to non-joinder of a necessary party. a. When objection can be raised 1055. The objection as to the named plaintiff can be raised by motion before trial or at the trial itself fed. r. civ. p. 12h2. But delay may result in estoppel against raising it. If the objection is first made on appeal, it is too late unless serious injustice would inevitably result from the non-joinder. Provident Bank and Trust Co. v. Patterson, 390 U.S., 102 b. No cause of action 1056. If the named plaintiff has no substantive interest in the claim being enforced, he has no cause of action. This objection is therefore proper at any time prior to judgment. Note, however, that under the usual rules governing appeal, a claim that the plaintiff has no cause of action cannot be raised on appeal for the first time, and the objection cannot be made in collateral attack on the judgment. b. Capacity of party to sue or be sued. 1. Definition 1057 Capacity refers to legal competence to be a party to a lawsuit. The plaintiff must have the capacity to sue, and the defendant must have the capacity to be sued. 2. Individuals 1058 The capacity of an individual to sue or be sued is determined by the law of her domicile. Fed. R. Sif. P. 17b1 If the plaintiff lacks capacity, as in the case of a minor, or an incompetent, suit must be maintained by a duly authorized or appointed guardian. If there is none, the court must appoint one for the particular action a guardian ad litem. Fed. R. Civ. P. 17 C. 2. A. Pleadings by Guardian 1059. If a guardian or conservator appears in the action, the pleadings are usually drawn in the name of the guardian for and on behalf of the incompetent or minor. Fed. R. Sif. P. 17C1 note that state practice on such pleadings varies. For example, in California, the pleadings are drawn in the name of the minor or incompetent by a guardian or conservator. Cal. Sif. Proc. Code 372. B. Incompetence right to disaffirm judgment 1060. If a minor or incompetent is a party to the action, but is not represented by a guardian, any judgment rendered is voidable by him within a reasonable time after attaining majority or being restored to competency, if it appears that his legal interests were inadequately protected in the action. Withers v. Tucker, 145 NW2D 665 Wise 1966 Minor Represented by Attorney 3. Corporations 1061. The capacity of a corporation to sue or be sued is determined by the law of the state in which it was organized. Example. Statutes in some states provide for suspension of powers of a corporation that is delinquent in paying its state taxes. C. E. G. Cal. Rev. And Tax Code 23301. In such a case, the corporation would have no power to sue defend itself, or appeal from a judgment as long as it is under the suspension. Mather Construction Co. v. United States, 475 F2D 1152 CT, CL, 1973. A. Limitation. A state cannot impose a disability on a corporation if doing so would violate federal law. Example. An attempt to deny an out-of-state corporation the right to sue in local courts to enforce a contract made in interstate commerce would violate federal law. A Lindbergh Cotton Co. v. Pittman, 419 U.S., 2019-74. 4. Partnerships 1062. 
Two issues arise with respect to the capacity of partnerships. I whether the partnership can or must sue as an entity, distinct from its members. And Roman II if the suit is by one or more of the members of the partnership, whether they should be named individually or should sue in the name of the partnership. A. Federal Practice Entity vs. Aggregate 1063. In federal courts, a partnership can always sue or be sued as an entity if the litigation involves a federal question. However, in other cases including a diversity action, the partnership's capacity to sue or be sued is determined by the law of the state in which the federal court is located. Fed. R. Civ. P. 17 B. 3. B. State law varies 1064. About half the states permit a partnership to be sued, but not to sue, as an entity in its common name. In those states, actions on a partnership claim must be brought in the names of the individual partners e.g. Alistair, Bert, and Chip, as co-partners doing business as Acme Partnership. Other states allow the partnership to both sue and be sued as an entity. See Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 3695 b. 5. Unincorporated Associations 1065. At common law, unincorporated associations lacked capacity to sue or be sued as entities. Ostrom v. Green. 161 NY. 35319. A. State Practice 1066. Many states now treat unincorporated associations like corporations. See Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 3695 B. Wright v. Arkansas Activities Association. 501 F2D 25 8th Sir. 1974. B. Federal Practice 1067. In federal courts. An association has capacity to sue or be sued when a federal right is being enforced by or against the association. But when a state law right is being enforced, as in a diversity action, the capacity of an unincorporated association is determined by the law of the state in which the federal action is brought. Fed. R. Civ. P. 17 B. 3. 1. Existence of Diversity 1068. For purposes of determining the existence of diversity of citizenship, the association is considered a citizen of each state of which any one of its members is a citizen. C. Supra, 332. C. Real Party and Interest Rule 1069. Even where an unincorporated association has the capacity to sue, it must assert a claim that belongs to it, rather than to its members individually. Example. An unincorporated association of businesses has standing to seek an injunction against conduct constituting unfair competition to its members, but not to seek damages for past injury to the members, as such rights do not belong to the association. Travel Agents Malpractice Action Corp. v. Regal Cultural Society, 287 A2D4NJ, 1972. 6. Attacking Lack of Capacity. A. Lack of capacity on face of complaint 1970. If lack of capacity appears on the face of the complaint, the complaint is subject to a motion to dismiss or demur in some states. Usually, however, it does not appear on the face and must be raised by motion for summary judgment or in the answer. B. Lack of capacity, not raised by time of answer 1971. If lack of capacity is not raised by the time of the answer, the defect is waived. The judgment entered will determine the rights of the party despite his lack of capacity, unless the party can show that she was inadequately represented C. Supra, 1060. C. Joinder of Parties. 1. In general 1972. Determining which parties are to be joined as plaintiffs or defendants requires consideration of the rules of compulsory and permissive joinder. Compulsory joinder rules cover parties who must be joined, indispensable parties, and those who should be joined if possible, conditionally necessary parties. The rules of permissive joinder apply to parties who may be joined, proper parties. 2. Permissive joinder 1973. At common law, 
and under the early codes, a plaintiff's joinder options were limited. Under the federal rules and modern code, however, a plaintiff may join anyone involved in the transaction, that is the subject matter of the suit. A. Early Approach 1D74 Under the original codes, parties could be joined only if they each had an interest in both the subject of the action and the relief sought. The rules governing joinder of causes of action required that causes joined affect all parties joined. These rules prevented joinder in many cases where the need was obvious. Example. Wife, injured by defendant's negligence, sues for her injuries. Husband attempts to join his claim for loss of her services. Joinder was not proper under the early approach because husband had no interest in the relief sought by wife, and vice versa. Ryder v. Jefferson Hotel Co. 113 C. 474 SC. 1922. B. Modern Approach 175. Today, parties may join or be joined in one action if I. A right to relief is asserted by or against them jointly, severally, or in the alternative. Roman 2. The right to relief arises out of the same transaction or series of transactions. And Roman 3. There is at least one question of law or fact common to all parties sought to be joined. Fed. R. Civ. P. 28. One. Relief sought. A. Separate or joint 1976. Each plaintiff is not required to have an interest in every cause of action or in all the relief prayed for. If there are several plaintiffs, they have the option to seek separate relief or joint relief. Likewise, if several defendants are joined, relief may be sought against each separately or against them jointly. b. In the alternative plaintiff in doubt, 1977. Sometimes, a plaintiff may be in doubt as to which of several defendants is liable for his injuries e.g. Plaintiff is injured by a bullet fired by either defendant 1 or defendant 2. In such a case, it is proper for the plaintiff to set forth a claim against each defendant in the alternative, so that their respective liabilities can be determined. 2. Same transaction requirement 178. The requirement that the right to relief arise from the same transaction or series of transactions is construed very broadly. Some causal relationship or interrelation among the defendant's conduct, or in the interest being asserted by multiple plaintiffs, is sufficient. This tends to merge with the common question requirement, below. Example. Plaintiff was permitted to join a claim against an insur ants company for inducing plaintiff to refrain from suing within the statute of limitations period with a claim against his former attorney for negligently failing to file the suit on time. Requeg v. Federal Mutual Insurance Co. 27 FRD 431 ND in 1961 A. Note Where defendants are joined in the alternative, because the plaintiff is in doubt about which one caused his injuries. The injury issue supplies the requisite relationship between the claims joined, even where the conduct of the two defendants is otherwise factually unrelated. Example. Where plaintiff claims permanent back injuries after involvement in two unrelated traffic accidents. Alleging doubt as to whether his back injury was caused by accident one or accident two. Joinder of both drivers as defendants is proper. Landau v. Salem, 4 Cal, 3D 901, 1971. 3. Common question requirement 1979. It is sufficient if there is a single question of law or fact common to all parties joined. However, it is not necessary that the common question be in dispute. Example. Plaintiff 1 a driver, and plaintiff too, a passenger in the car, sue defendant for injuries sustained in an auto accident. The common question is whether defendant was negligent. This is sufficient for joinder purposes, even though there are also many separate questions involved e.g. injuries sustained by each, 
any contributory negligence barring plaintiff one's claim, etc. A. Caution. If the common question is relatively unimportant, the court will tend to define the transaction somewhat more narrowly to prevent joinder of claims that have no significant evidentiary relationship to each other. Hence, a practical test for permissive joinder is applied. Are the issues in the two claims factually intertwined with each other in any significant way? 4. Additional Unrelated Claims 1080 As long as the requirements for joinder of parties above are met, each of the parties joined may assert as many claims as she has against any opposing party. Fed. R. Sif. P. 18. The policy of the law is to allow unlimited joinder of claims as long as there is a transactional connection among all of the parties. Example. Plaintiff joins defendant one against whom he asserts claims for injuries, while a passenger in defendant two's vehicle, and defendant two against whom he asserts claims for the same injuries in the accident, and also for failure to pay a promissory note that defendant two executed in favor of plaintiff. This. Joinder is proper. 5. Power of court to order separate trials 1081. To curb expense or delay or to avoid prejudice that might result from the joinder of numerous parties, asserting numerous separate claims against one another. The court may order separate trials for various claims joined, or otherwise regulate the proceedings to minimize the difficulties involved. Fed. R. Civ. P. 20B. 6. Attacking Improper Joinder 1082. Under the federal rules, a misjoined claim may be dismissed on motion of the party against whom it is asserted, and the whole action may be dismissed as to that party if no claim for relief remains against him. Fed. R. Civ. P. 21 Under Code Pleading Practice A demurrer will lie for misjoinder of claims. Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 43010D. C. Subject Matter Jurisdiction 1083 in addition to the requirements of personal jurisdiction over defendants, federal subject matter jurisdiction requirements must be satisfied as to all parties whether plaintiffs or defendants permissively joined. Supplemental jurisdiction does not extend to permissive joinder when the permissively joined matter is not part of the same case or controversy with a claim over which the federal court has original jurisdiction, or in diversity cases where banned by 28 U.S.C. Section 1367B. C. Supra. 455 472. 3. Compulsory Joinder 1084. Joinder is required for any person who has a material interest in the case and whose absence would result in substantial prejudice to the absentee or to other parties before the court. Fed. R. Civ. P. 19. A. Traditional Approach Necessary vs. Indispensable Parties 1085 Historically, the statutes and cases drew a distinction between necessary and indispensable parties. 1. Necessary Parties 1086 Necessary parties were those who ought to be joined if possible. However, if their interests were severable, and if one or more were not joined e.g. could not be located, the court could still determine the rights and liabilities of the parties before the court. 2. Indispensable Parties 1087 Indispensable parties, on the other hand, were those whose interests were so unavoidably involved i.e. non-severable that the court could not proceed without them. Failure to join such parties meant that the action had to be dismissed. Shields v. Barrow, 58 U.S. 131-855. 3. Criticism. A party's interest could always be severed somehow, simply by leaving his interests out of the judgment and allowing them to be adjudicated later. Hence, the issue in distinguishing necessary and indispensable parties was not whether the absentee's interests were in fact severable, they always were, but whether they should be adjudicated along with those already present in the action. B. Modern Approach Practical Considerations 1088 Modern rules recognize that the labels necessary and indispensable 
merely reflect conclusions arrived at for other reasons. Hence, these rules focus on the practical consequences if a party with an interest in the action is not before the court. Provident Bank and Trust Co. v. Patterson, Supra, 1055. 1. Persons to be joined, if feasible, 1089. Federal Rule 19, A provides that any person with an interest in the subject matter of a pending action shall be joined as a party if I. In his absence, complete relief cannot be accorded those already parties fed. R. Civ. P. 19A1A, or Roman 2. His interest is such that to proceed without him would be substantially prejudicial as a practical matter, because it would I. Impair his ability to protect his interest in later proceedings fed. R. Civ. P. 19A1 by, or Roman 2. Expose the parties already before the court to the risk of double liability or inconsistent obligations fed. R. Civ. P. 19A1BI. For examples, C. Infra, 1E90 1 1E102. A caveat. Although the modern pragmatic approach has been adopted in the federal courts and in many states, some decisions still assert that certain types of parties e.g. partial assignees, infra, 1E96 always must be joined i.e. that these parties are indispensable. A review of the case law, therefore, reveals two conflicting rules. I that compulsory joinder is a pragmatic problem, and Roman II that it is jurisdictional in that an action cannot proceed without an indispensable party. 2. Effect of non-joinder possible dismissal 1 thing 90. If a person to be joined cannot be made a party e.g. because he is not subject to the court's jurisdiction, the court must determine whether, in equity and in good conscience, the action can proceed without him, or whether the action should be dismissed. The court's determination is based on the following practical considerations fed. R. Civ. P. 19b. A. The extent to which any judgment rendered in the action would be prejudicial to the interest of the absent party, or the interests of those already before the court. B. The extent to which such prejudice could be lessened or avoided by appropriate court action. C. Whether relief rendered without the absent party would be adequate. And D whether the plaintiff has any other adequate remedy if the action is dismissed for non-joinder of the absent party. 3. Application 1991. Situations in which compulsory joinder issues commonly arise involve a. Joint obligors. 1. Parties to contract 1992. Joint promisers under a contract and other joint debtors should be joined as defendants wherever possible. However, if one cannot be joined, the court can still proceed against those before the court. Janney Montgomery Scott, Inc., v. Shepard Niles, Inc., 11 F3D 399 3D Sir, 1993. A. Rationale. There is no substantial prejudice to the parties before the court that would justify dismissal, since an obligor held responsible on the joint debt has a right of contribution against the other joint obligors. 2. Tortfeasers 1D93. Although the plaintiff may join in one action all defendants potentially liable to her as a result of a given transaction or occurrence see supra, 1D75, ordinarily she is not required to do so, and a joint tortfeasor is not considered a necessary party. Temple v. Sins Corp. 498 U.S. 5 it has long been the rule that it is not necessary for all joint tortfeasors to be named as defendants in a single lawsuit. A. Rationale. The plaintiff is the master of her lawsuit and can choose to sue as many or as few potential defendants as she desires. B. Distinguish in Pleader 1094. Often there is a right of contribution among joint tortfeasors. Where this is so, those defendants who are sued can file third-party complaints or cross-complaints depending on the jurisdiction against the other tortfeasors for indemnity C infra. 1 and 1 14. American Motorcycle Association v. Superior Court, 20 Cal, 
3D 578-1978 note. This maneuver does not make the new party a defendant on the plaintiff's complaint unless the plaintiff amends to assert a claim against the new defendant. The only claim asserted against the new defendant is to indemnify the original defendant. b. Joint Obligies 1 the 95 Where persons are jointly owed a duty under a contract, the courts have usually held that they are not only necessary, but also indispensable parties, and have dismissed for non-joinder. Jenkins v. Renault, 697 F2D 166 Sir, 1983 1. Rationale A promise made to the obligies jointly should be enforced jointly since otherwise there is a risk that the right of the absent obligee to enforce the promise may be prejudiced. That the defendant might be subjected to inconsistent obligations in an action brought by the absent obligee, and that the court would be unable to afford complete relief because it could not provide in its decree for the defendant's obligations to the non party while enforcing the same promise for the plaintiff. c. Partial assignees or subrogies 1d96. In an action by a partial assignee or subrogee to enforce its share of a debt, all other partial owners are necessary parties who should be joined if feasible. Online Technologies v. Perkin Elmer Corp. 141F, SUP, 2D 246D, Con, 2001. Peerless Insurance Co. v. Superior Court, 6 Cal, App, 3D 358 1970 insured with claims over policy limit was necessary, but not indispensable party in suit by insurer subrogy who had paid up to policy limit. D. Co-owners of property 1D97. Co-owners of property are necessary parties in situations where the interests of all should be decided on a consistent basis e.g. rescission granted to one should be granted to all. Feinberg v. Feinberg, 924 SW2D 328 Mo, 1996. 1. Conflicting Claims 1098 If the action seeks to determine conflicting claims between persons claiming co-ownership of property, all co-owners are necessary parties e.g. action for partition by one of several tenants in common, suit to fix shares of beneficiaries in a trust, suit by one of several partners to dissolve the partnership. 2. Suits to establish adverse interest 1d99. Similarly, in suits by a third person to establish or enforce an interest in the property, all co-owners must be joined if possible e.g. suits to foreclose a mortgage, remove an easement, and the like. e. Third-party beneficiary suits. 1. Original parties to contract need not be joined 1d100. If a third-party beneficiary sues on a contract, the federal courts have uniformly rejected the argument that the original parties to the contract must be joined. Shulman v. J.P. Morgan Investment Management, Inc. 35 F3D 799 3D Sir. 1994. 2. Third-party beneficiary need not be joined 1D101. If an original party to a contract sues, a third-party beneficiary is not an indispensable party. 5th Third Bank of Western Ohio v. United States, 55 Fed, CL, 372 2003. F. Shareholders' Derivative Suit 1 on 102. In a derivative suit by a shareholder, i.e., suing on a cause of action belonging to the corporation, because the corporation refuses to sue, the corporation is an indispensable party. Its rights are so inextricably involved that no complete judgment can be rendered unless it is subject to the court's jurisdiction. c. Procedure for compelling joinder. 1. Must name all necessary parties 1e103. In the complaint, the plaintiff should set forth the names of all necessary persons who have not been joined, and the reasons for their non-joinder. Fed. R. Civ. P. 19c however. This provision is not effective because plaintiffs rarely concede that non-parties are necessary parties. 2. Failure to name all necessary parties 1 in 104. If the plaintiff fails to allege the existence of such parties, the defendant can raise the matter in a motion to dismiss under Federal Rule 12 
or in the answer. Failure to object may constitute waiver. C. Infra, 1 in 110. 3. Joinder of necessary parties, ordered if feasible 1 in 105. If the plaintiff has failed to join necessary parties, the court will order that they be joined, unless it is impossible to do so i.e. because their joinder would destroy subject matter jurisdiction, or because the court lacks personal jurisdiction over them. A. Involuntary Plaintiff 1E106 If the absentee should be aligned as a plaintiff, he may be joined as an involuntary plaintiff. Fed. R. Civ. P. 19A2 B. Necessary parties too numerous 1 on 107. If the necessary parties are too numerous to be joined, it is possible that the case might be handled as a class action. C. Infra, 1E181 at SEC. C. Venue 1T108. If addition of the necessary party would make venue improper, the added party must be dismissed if she objects to venue. Then the court must decide whether to dismiss. 4. Dismissal if joinder not feasible 1T109. If the court cannot order the necessary parties joined because of lack of personal jurisdiction or because their presence would destroy diversity of citizenship, it must decide whether to dismiss the action. C. Supra, 1E94 criteria used to decide whether to dismiss. D. Waiver of right to compel joinder 1E110. Non-joinder of an absentee should be raised at the earliest possible opportunity by the parties to the action. Otherwise, delay may constitute waiver of the right to compel joinder. 1. If absentee is indispensable 1D111. If the absentee is determined to be indispensable, his non-joinder can be raised at any time by pleading or motion, even at the trial of the action. Fed. R. Civ. P. 12H2 However, delay in raising the objection is one of the factors the court will consider in exercising its discretion as to whether to dismiss the action i.e. in deciding whether the absentee is indispensable. Provident Bank and Trust Co. v. Patterson, Supra, 1088. 2. No waiver by absentee 1 in 112. The failure of the parties to raise the defect of non-joinder in no way constitutes a waiver by the absentee. Since she is not a party to the action, the judgment is not legally binding on her. Martin v. Wilkes, 490 U.S., 755, 1989. 4. Impleter 1D113. Impleter is a procedure that permits the defendant to bring into the lawsuit a third person who is or may be liable for all or part of the plaintiff's claim against the defendant. Fed. R. Civ. P. 14 in some states. The same remedy may be secured by a cross-complaint bringing in the third person. Two features of impleader guard against prejudice to the third party. I. The third party may plead any defenses that the defendant might have against the plaintiff's claim and may participate fully in defending against the claim. And Roman II, the court may grant a separate trial on any separate issues of the third-party claim if needed to prevent undue confusion or prejudice. A. Limited to claims for indemnification, 1 in 114. Impleader under the federal rules is confined to those situations in which the defending party has a right to indemnity, in whole or in part, against the impleaded third party i.e., where the defendant asserts that if he is held liable to the plaintiff, he would be entitled to collect all or some part of the judgment from the third party. This includes a claim to contribution in states where a defendant is allowed to claim contribution from a person that the plaintiff did not originally join as a defendant. 1. How right is determined 1 in 115? Whether the defendant has any such right to indemnification, etc. is a question of substantive law, and under the Erie Doctrine, the federal court must therefore refer to the appropriate state statutes and case law. a. No right to indemnification under state law 1E116. If the appropriate state law does not recognize such a right, the fact that the impleader procedure is available in federal court does not create one for the defendant. b. Liability under state law 
may be accelerated, 1 in 117. However, federal impleter may accelerate liability created by state law. For example, if, under state law, the defendant can seek indemnity from a third person only after paying a judgment to the plaintiff, the defendant in federal court may implead the third person and assert his claim conditionally. If the plaintiff recovers, the defendant should get judgment thereby closing the time gap between liability to the plaintiff and receipt of an indemnity judgment against the third party. Ohio Savings Bank v. Manhattan Mortgage Co. 455 F. SEP. 2D 247 SDNY. 26. C. Contribution among tortfeasors 1 on 118. Most states allow contribution among tortfeasors only when judgment is rendered against all of them. For federal impleter purposes, this means that the defendant in a personal injury action cannot implead other tortfeasors to seek contribution, because their liability arises only after the plaintiff obtains judgment against all of them. Connors v. Suburban Propane Co. 916F, SUP, 73 DNH, 1996. 1. But note. If state law allows contribution where judgment is obtained against only one tortfeasor, the situation is essentially one of partial indemnity, and the tortfeasor who is sued can implead the other to recover it. See American Motorcycle Association v. Superior Court, Supra, 1E94. 2. Potential liability sufficient, 1E119. Rule 14 authorizes impleader of any person who is or may be liable for any part of the plaintiff's claim. Thus, impleader is proper before any loss actually has been paid by the defendant. a. No direct action by plaintiff against defendant's liability insurer 1 and 120. In a liability suit, a plaintiff usually would be delighted to join the defendant's insurance carrier as a co-defendant to let the jury know that the defendant is insured. However, most states do not permit this, on the ground that the plaintiff has no right to relief against the defendant's insurance carrier, until she has first obtained a judgment against the defendant after which, the plaintiff would have an enforceable claim as third-party beneficiary of the insurance company's promise to indemnify the defendant. 1. Minority Rule Contra 1E121 A few states are contra, with direct action statutes, that permit joinder of the defendant's insurance carrier in the original action. C. Watson v. Employers Liability Assurance Corp. 348 U.S. 66 1954 Direct Action Statute may constitutionally apply despite provision in insurance contract conditioning duty to indemnify on entry of judgment against insured. B. Defendant's right to implead insurer 1122. It may be that the defendant himself will seek to bring his liability insurer into the action e.g. when the insurer has failed or refused to defend the action. Where this is the case, impleader may be permitted to obtain a prompt determination of the defendant's insurance coverage and avoid a multiplicity of suits. Government Employees Insurance Co. v. United States 400 F2D 172 10th Sir 1968 3. Distinguish alternative liability to plaintiff 1 in 123. It is not sufficient for impleader that the third-party defendant may be liable to the plaintiff for the plaintiff's injuries. Only when the law gives the present defendant a right to relief in the form of indemnity from the third-party defendant is impleader permitted. Example. Plaintiff contracted trichinosis and sued defendant 1 which manufactured a cooker plaintiff claimed had failed properly to cook pork she ate on July 9. Defendant 1 sought to implead the college that plaintiff attended, claiming that her trichinosis had actually resulted from eating pork in the college cafeteria on July 8. The court dismissed the third-party complaint because contribution will not arise from distinct causes of action, regardless of how similar the events may have been or how close in time they may have occurred. Klotz v. Superior Electric Products Corp. 498F, SUP, 1D99ED, PA, 1980. 4. Supplemental Jurisdiction Over Related Claims, 1E124. In federal court litigation, 
the court has supplemental jurisdiction to adjudicate a claim by the original defendant third-party defendant in the impleader for his own injuries when joined with a claim for indemnity. A. But note. At least in diversity actions, there is no supplemental jurisdiction over a claim by the original plaintiff against the third-party defendant, even if it arises out of the transaction originally sued on. Example. Plaintiff sues defendant, who impledes third party, a citizen of the same state as plaintiff. Plaintiff may not assert a separate claim against third party, because there is no diversity between them and ancillary jurisdiction will not be permitted. Owen Equipment and Erection Co. v. Kroger, 437 U.S., 365 1978, 28 U.S.C., 1367 B. B. Pleadings and Procedure 1 on 125. Leave of court is not required for impleader. If the defendant third-party plaintiff files a third-party complaint of impleader within 10 days after he serves his original answer. Thereafter, leave of court is required, and grant of the motion is at the discretion of the court. Fed. R. Civ. P. 14. 1. Answer 1 me 126. The impleted party must file an answer to the third-party complaint, and the answer may raise whatever defenses could be asserted to the original cause of action plaintiff vs. Defendant. Rationale. The purpose is to prevent collusion between the original parties, the defendant admitting or defaulting to the plaintiff's claim, in order to affix liability on the impleted party. 2. Counterclaim or cross-claim 1E127. The impleted party may also file a counterclaim or cross-claim against existing parties, or may implead any person who may be liable to him, subject to the jurisdictional limits noted below. Fed. R. Civ. P. 14A2. C. Possibility of separate trials. 1E128. The trial court has discretion to order a separate trial of the impleted claim to avoid undue trial confusion or prejudice. Fed. R. Civ. P. 42b. D. Effect on jurisdiction. And venue 1 and 129. An impleader claim is usually deemed ancillary to the main claim and has no effect on jurisdictional and venue requirements. Thus, an independent ground of federal jurisdiction need not be established, and the impleted defendant cannot object to venue. Grundle Lining Construction Corp. v. Adams County Asphalt, Inc., 85 F3D 201 5th Sir. 1996, 28 U.S.C., 1367. e. Distinguish Cross Claim 10130. Impleader is somewhat similar to the cross-claim procedure discussed supra, 933 at sec. However, there are significant differences. 1. An impleader can be asserted only against a person, not yet a party, whereas a cross-claim is filed by one party against another party to the action. 2. Impleader must be based on a claim for indemnification or contribution while there is no such limitation on cross-claims. 5. Intervention 1E131 Intervention is a procedure whereby a non-party, upon timely application, may become a party in a lawsuit in order to protect her interests in that action. Whether intervention is allowed depends on a balancing of two conflicting policies. I that the plaintiff should be allowed to be master of his action, in the sense of joining such parties with him, or against him as he wishes. And Roman II that other interested parties and the court have an interest in avoiding multiplicity of litigation or inconsistency of result, which may require overriding the plaintiff's choice of parties. A. Types of intervention in federal cases 1 and 132. There are several types of intervention under Federal Rule 24. 1. Intervention of Right Federal Statute 1 D 133. Intervention is granted as a matter of right, where a federal statute confers an unconditional right to intervene e.g. 28 U.S.C. Section 2403 Intervention by United States is a matter of right in any suit in which the constitutionality of an act of Congress is in question. Fed. R. Civ. P. 2401. 
2. Intervention of Right to Protect Intervenor's Interest, 1134. Intervention of right is also granted when the applicant claims an interest relating to the property or transaction that is the subject of the action and is so situated that the disposition of the action may, as a practical matter, impair or impede the applicant's ability to protect that interest. Fed. R. Civ. P. 2482. A. Nature of Interest 1 in 135. The Supreme Court has stated that only a significantly protectable interest suffices to support intervention of right. Donaldson v. United States, 400 U.S., 517-1970, won some lower courts emphasize a direct, substantial, and legally protectable interest to satisfy this standard, while others take a more relaxed attitude. Example. Opponents of abortion could intervene in an action challenging a city's moratorium on abortion clinics in an area on the ground that they owned houses in the area and were defending their property values, but not on the ground that they were opposed to abortion. Interests in property are the most elementary type of right that Rule 24a is designed to protect. Planned Parenthood v. Citizens for Community Action 558 F2D 861-8 Sir 1977. Example. Rate payers of a utility could not intervene in a contract action between the utility and a supplier concerning the amounts the utility would have to pay for boiler fuel. Although the outcome of the litigation could affect the rates interveners would have to pay, they had no legally protectable interest in the contract dispute. New Orleans Public Service, Inc. v. United Gas Pipeline Co. 732 F2D 452 Fifth Sir. 1984. 1. Standing 1 in 136. The Supreme Court has not decided whether an intervener must have standing to intervene C. E.G. Diamond v. Charles. 476 U.S. 54 1986. And the lower courts are divided on whether standing is required compare Ruiz v. Estelle. 161 F3D 814 Fifth Sir. 1998 interveners need not satisfy standing requirements. With Muva Pharmaceutical Corp. v. Shalala. 140 F3D 1060 DC. Sir. 1998 party that seeks to intervene as of right must satisfy standing requirements. b. Outcome of litigation may impair interveners' interests. 1 E 137. The intervener must also show that the resolution of the litigation would impair her interest. This is not limited to legally binding effects, such as res judicata, but looks to the practical impact of resolution of the litigation on the intervener's interest. Example. Plaintiff brought suit against a federal agency, claiming that the agency was improperly allowing the state to issue licenses to run uranium mills without first requiring preparation of environmental impact statements. Companies with license applications pending were allowed to intervene. Rationale. As a practical matter, such applicants would be affected by the outcome of the litigation if it caused the state agency to alter its mode of operation and require more of applicants for licenses. Natural Resources Defense Council v. United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission 578 F2D 1E 341 10th Sir. 1978. Compare. Where a commercial tenant of a shopping center sought to enjoin a lease to another prospective commercial tenant on the ground that the plaintiff's lease limited the number of jewelry stores in the shopping center, interests of the prospective tenant might be affected if it could not compel performance of defendant's commitment to lease space to it but the court nevertheless held that the prospective tenant was not a necessary party. Hellsberg's Diamond Shops, Inc. v. Valley West Des Moines Shopping Center, Inc. 564 F2D 816 8th Sir. 1977. 1. Stair de Sissies Effect 1 in 138. It is sometimes argued that the stair de Sissies effect alone is sufficient to justify intervention of right. When a unique issue of law is involved, and there is little likelihood that it will be reconsidered after it is decided in the current litigation, that may be sufficient. See Atlantis Development Corp. v. United States, 
379 F2D 818 5th Sir. 1967 Issue of Application of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act to Specific Islands that Intervenor Sought to Develop More Generally. However, the fact that resolution of a question of law might affect cases to which the intervenor is, or may in the future be, a party would more properly be considered a ground for amicus curiae briefs from friends of the court than for intervenor status. c. Intervenor, not adequately represented by present parties, 1e139. If the intervenor claims the right kind of interest and shows a threat of practical impairment, intervention could be denied on the ground that the intervenor's interest is adequately represented by the present parties. 1. Minimal Burden 140. The Supreme Court has said that the burden of demonstrating inadequacy of representation is minimal. T. R. Bovich v. United Mine Workers, 404 U.S., 518, 1972. 2. Factors 10141. A variety of factors can be considered in evaluating the adequacy of representation, including the amount at stake for the intervenor and the present parties, the ability and resources of the present parties to litigate effectively, and the existence of any conflicts of interest between the present party and the intervenors. 3. Concern with complication of action, 1 on 142. Although it is said that the burden of showing inadequacy is minimal, in order to avoid complication of the action due to the addition of too many new parties, courts will resist multiple intervention applications by parties in similar situations. d. Distinguish compulsory joinder 1 on 143. The grounds for intervention of right are analogous to the grounds for finding non-parties to be necessary parties under Rule 19a1b. See Supra, 1089. As a result, if there is a question on an examination raising issues under one of these rules, the effect of the other should be considered. 1. Intervention more flexible 1d144. Even though the language of the rules for intervention and necessary parties is similar, courts seem more willing to find a non-party's interests are of the protected type and are threatened, and therefore protected, when intervention is sought. This is because the non-party intervenor has indicated a desire to participate in the litigation, and the conclusion that intervention of right is proper does not mean that the litigation should not proceed unless all similarly situated non-parties are joined. Under Rule 19, the finding that a person with a certain interest should be joined means that all others with that interest should also be joined. Two. Adequacy of representation requirement, 1 in 145. This difference in treatment is confirmed by the adequacy of representation requirement for intervention. Under Rule 19, the adequacy of the present parties to protect the interests of the non-party ordinarily does not relieve the court of the duty to add the necessary party. When Rule 19 is invoked, but representation seems adequate, treatment as a class action may be in order. C. Infra, 1e weud 81 at sec. E. Conditions on intervention, 1e 146. Although this form of intervention is designated of right, the court may nevertheless impose conditions, such as limiting the intervenor to claims already raised by other parties, or requiring that the intervenor obtain permission from one of the original parties to make motions and take discovery. This authority derives from the court's general power to control the litigation before it. Stringfellow v. Concerned Neighbors in Action, 480 U.S., 370, 1987. 3. Permissive Intervention 1E 147. The court has discretion to permit a non-party to intervene if i. A federal statute confers a conditional right to intervene, or Roman 2. A question of law or fact in common with the main action is part of the applicant's claim or defense. Fed. R. Civ. P. 24b1. A. Common question. Example. In a suit to set aside a zoning ordinance, adjoining property owners may intervene if their claims present common questions of law or fact. Walt v. Peretsky. 144 F2D 505 DC, Sir. 
1944. 1. Distinguish permissive joinder rules 1 and 148. Permissive intervention is the counterpart of permissive joinder under Federal Rule 20A. The standard for permissive intervention corresponds to that for permissive joinder, i.e., a common question, interpreted as claims arising from the same or a related transaction. b. Broad discretion in Court 1 in 149. The trial court has very broad discretion under Federal Rule 24b in granting or denying permissive joinder, and a reversal on appeal is almost impossible to obtain. c. Conditions imposed by Court 1E150. The court will often condition intervention in a lawsuit by limiting the intervener's claims to those directly involved in the pending action. 4. Timeliness of intervention. 1E151. Whether the intervention sought is of right or permissive, the motion for leave to intervene must be made in a timely fashion. However, since a potential intervener of right may be seriously harmed if excluded from the action. Intervention motions rarely should be denied as being untimely. b. Effect of intervention in federal cases. 1. Subject matter jurisdiction, 1 and 152. If the action is in federal court solely on grounds of diversity, there is no supplemental jurisdiction over claims by interveners or claims by the plaintiff against persons who intervene. 28 U.S.C. 1367b. C. Supra. 455-472. In those circumstances, there must be an independent basis for federal court jurisdiction to permit assertion of the claim. If federal jurisdiction does not depend solely on diversity of citizenship, there would usually be supplemental jurisdiction over claims by or against interveners of right. 28 U.S.C. 1367a. 2. Venue 1 153. The intervener cannot question the propriety of venue in the original action, since her act of intervening is a submission to the court in question. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America v. Thompson, 259 F. Sup. 2 D 39 DDC. T3 Venue Objections, however, may be raised by someone who is already a party to the action. 3. Judgment 1D154. Any judgment rendered subsequent to intervention is binding on the intervening party, as if she had originally been a party, and she has a similar right of appeal. Association of Banks in Insurance, Inc. v. Dury, 270F3D397-6 Sir. 2001. C. State Practice 1E155. Most states have intervention provisions patterned on the federal rules. In other states, statutes on intervention provide that a person having an interest in the matter in litigation may intervene in an action between other parties. See Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 387A. 1. Broad discretion in Court 1E156. The term interest in such statutes is very vague but usually has been limited to a legal interest. The term may indicates that intervention is never of right. Thus, intervention in state court actions largely depends on the discretion of the trial court. Often, permission is denied on the ground that the plaintiff has the right to choose the parties to his action. 2. Modern trend to permit intervention, 1A157. However, under the influence of Federal Intervention Rules Supra, state courts are becoming more liberal in permitting intervention. 6. Consolidation of Separate Actions, 1A158 Even when joinder rules do not permit the addition of new parties to an action, almost the same result can be achieved by consolidating separate suits pending in the same court. The court has broad discretion, on its own motion or on the motion of a party, to consolidate actions involving common issues e.g. liability of common carrier in mass accident litigation. Consolidation can be complete so that the separate suits effectively become one, although they are technically not merged, or it may be partial e.g. consolidation for purposes of determining liability, with separate trials on the issue of damages. CFED R. CIF. P. 42.
7. Interpleader 1T159 Interpleader is a device that enables a party against whom conflicting claims with respect to the same debt or property are asserted the stakeholder to join all the adverse claimants in the same action and require them to litigate among themselves to determine which, if any, has a valid claim to the debt or property involved. Once the stakeholder's right to interplead is established and he has deposited the funds or property in court, he can be released or discharged from the litigation. It is up to the adverse claimants to litigate their claims to the property. If the stakeholder denies any liability at all, or if he has a claim to the fund, he remains a party. Examples An escrow holder may interplead adverse claimants to funds deposited with him. Or a life insurance company, upon the death of the insured, may, if the policy proceeds are claimed by both the named beneficiary and some third person, Interplead the various claimants. A. Background 1 on 160. Interpleader originated in the equity courts as a way to protect a stakeholder from possible legally inconsistent liability and to avoid multiplicity of actions and the risk of inconsistent results. Historically, the plaintiff had to admit liability on the obligation in question and the conflicting claims had to be mutually exclusive. But these limitations are not recognized under modern law. C. 28 U.S.C. 1D335. Fed. R. Civ. P. 22. B. Procedure 1D161. The party against whom claims are being made may institute the interpleader action himself, naming all claimants as defendants. Or he may interplead in any action pending between the adverse claimants. If he is named as a defendant in such an action, he may interplead by filing a counterclaim C infra. 1 in Weird 76. 1. Deposits stake with court wanting 162. To invoke statutory interpleader C infra. 1 in Winard 67. The plaintiff must deposit or give security for the entire amount in his possession that is claimed by the claimants and may not hold back amounts that he claims. Hartford Life Insurance Co. v. Einhorn X. Rel. Estate of Mayring, 452 F. Sup. 2D126 EDNY, 26. A. No deposit required for Rule Interpleader, 1L163. Where Rule 22 Interpleader is properly invoked C. Infra, 1 in 169 at sec. There is no requirement that the stake be deposited in court. 2. Plaintiff may claim interest 1E164. E As indicated above, interpleader is permitted even if the plaintiff denies any liability or claims some offset or defense. Such cases are often referred to as actions in the nature of interpleader, following Old English practice. The difference is that classic interpleader involves a disinterested stakeholder, making no claim to the property while an action in the nature of interpleader is brought by an interested stakeholder, such as an insurance company denying liability. C. E.G. State Farm Fire and Casualty Co. V. Tosher, 386 U.S. 523 1967. 3. Defendants may cross-file claims 1E165, where the stakeholder initiates interpleader. The adverse claimants can and usually do file cross claims C infra, 1E would do in 76 against each other to obtain a judicial determination of their respective rights in the fund or property interpleaded. C. Types of federal interpleader actions, 1E166. In federal practice, there are two distinct interpleader remedies. 1. Statutory interpleader 1E167. Interpleader is permitted by 28 U.S.C. Section 1E335, which contains special provisions as to jurisdiction, venue, and service of process if a. Two or more claimants of diverse citizenship are making adverse claims to the same debt, instrument, or property owed or held by the plaintiff, and b. The debt, instrument, or property has a value of at least $500. 2. Rule 22 Interpleader 1E168 
Federal Rule 22 permits interpleader in any action that meets the normal jurisdictional requirements in federal court i.e. a sufficient amount in controversy if applicable and proper diversity or federal question. D. Differences between statutory and Rule 22 interpleader, 20 169. The existence of two forms of federal interpleader can be confusing. Rule 22 interpleader is needed for cases that do not meet the specialized requirements of statutory interpleader. Statutory interpleader is framed to focus on situations involving scattered claimants below. The basic differences between interpleader under Section 1A335 and under Rule 22 are as follows. 1. Requirements for diversity jurisdiction, 1A170. Depending on the type of federal interpleader action, either minimal or complete diversity is required. a. Statutory interpleader 1E171 In statutory interpleader, it is sufficient that diversity of citizenship exists between any two adverse claimants, but at least two claimants must be diverse. As long as such minimal diversity exists, the citizenship of the plaintiff stakeholder and any other claimants is immaterial. State Farm Fire and Casualty Co. V. Tosher, Supra. Example. In Circo, an Illinois insurance company is confronted by claims to insurance proceeds by Alpha, a citizen of Illinois, Bravo, another citizen of Illinois, and Charlie, a citizen of Wisconsin. There is sufficient diversity for statutory interpleader, even though in Circo as the plaintiff in the action and Alpha and Bravo as defendants are co citizens and Alpha and Bravo as competing claimants are co-citizens. The required minimal diversity is present because one of the claimants, Charlie, is not a co-citizen of the other claimants. b. Rule 22 Interpleader 1A172 In an interpleader action under Rule 22, there must be complete diversity between the plaintiff stakeholder and all of the adverse claimants, or a federal question must be involved. c. Distinguish all claimants citizens of one state, 1N173. Where all the claimants are citizens of one state, and the stakeholder is a citizen of another, the suit can be brought only under Rule 22. Since statutory interpleader requires some diversity among the claimants see supra. 2. Jurisdictional amount 1N174. In Statutory interpleader requires only that the debt or property involved be valued at $500 or more. Under Rule 22, if the case relies on diversity jurisdiction, the jurisdictional amount is the same as in any other civil action $75,000. 3. Limits of process, 1A175. In statutory interpleader, the reach of process is nationwide. 28 U.S.C. T3D61 under Rule 22. Service of process is the same as in any other civil action, i.e., within the territorial limits of the state in which the district court is located, except as extended by any applicable long arm statute. 4. Cross claims and counterclaims 1 in 176. The interpleaded claimants may and usually do cross claim against each other, counterclaim against the plaintiff and implead third parties, unless jurisdictional problems prevent their doing so. a. Subject matter jurisdiction, 1 in 177. Any additional claims that relate to the original interpleaded claim should fall within the supplemental jurisdiction of the court. Any other additional claims may be asserted only if there is an independent basis for subject matter jurisdiction. b. Service of process, 1 in 178. When a defendant is before the court only because of nationwide process under statutory interpleader, he is subject to additional claims through cross-claim, etc. Only if they are part of cleaning up the original interpleader claim. Example, Annie, a driver insured by Inserco for $20,000, injures Brian and Carrie, each of whom claims more than $20,000 in damages. Inserco interpleads Annie, Brian, and Carrie contending that there is no liability on Annie's part, but that if there is, the claims of Brian and Carrie to the insurance coverage should be interpleaded. Annie seeks to cross-claim against Carrie for Annie's own injuries, 
This would be disallowed if carry was before the court only through nationwide process, because it does not relate to Incirco's interpleader claim. See Allstate Insurance Co. v. McNeil, 382 F2D 84 4th Sir, 1967. 5. Venue 1 179. In statutory interpleader, venue is proper in the district in which any claimant resides. 28 U.S.C. 20 397 with interpleader under Rule 22. Venue is the same as in any other civil action, i.e., in the district in which a defendant resides, if all reside in the same state, or a district in which a substantial part of the events or omissions giving rise to the claim occurred. 28 U.S.C. 1E391A12. See Supra. 146 157 Alternatively, venue is proper in a district in which a substantial part of the property that is the subject of the action is located. 28 U.S.C. 1390 2 The location of the property may be a convenient venue in many interpleader cases. E. Erie Doctrine 1E180. The question of whether the interpleader remedy is available is a procedural matter and is decided pursuant to federal interpleader standards. To determine the law to be applied to the merits of the case, the federal court will look to appropriate state law. D. Class Actions 1. In general 1D181 One or more members of a class of persons similarly situated may sue or be sued on behalf of all members of that class. Such lawsuits are permitted where considerations of necessity or convenience justify an action on behalf of the group, rather than multiple actions by or against the class members individually. 2. Background A. Original Development in Equity 1E182 Class actions originally were permitted only in equity, and then only if it was shown. I that joinder of all parties having similar interests was impractical because the parties were too numerous, were presently unascertainable, or were not yet in being e.g. unborn heirs, and Roman II a few members could fairly represent all in the litigation. In such cases, the chancellors in equity permitted suit to be maintained by or against representatives of the class and, in some instances, held that the decree rendered in such an action was binding on all members of the class. 1. Comment Unless the joinder of all necessary parties was not practical usually because they were too numerous, the class action device was not needed, since adequate relief could be obtained in an ordinary action. b. Class actions under code, pleading 1 in 183. The grounds for maintenance of class suits in equity were carried over in the field code, which authorized such suits wherever there were questions of common or general interest of many persons, or when the parties were numerous, and it would be impracticable to bring them all before the court. See Cal. Civ. Proc. Code 382. 1. But note. The courts usually limited class actions to those asserting what formerly had been equitable as distinct from common law claims e.g. stockholder derivative suits creditors' bills to reach the assets of debtors, and injunction suits. 2. And note. The decisions were split as to whether the judgment in a class suit was binding on the absent members of the class. C. Class actions under the federal rules. 1. Former Federal Rule 23 184 As originally adopted in 1938, Federal Rule 23 provided for three different kinds of class actions. A. True Class Action 1D185 A true class action was one where the rights of all members of the class were joint or common. A judgment rendered in such an action bound all members of the class, including absentees. For example, stockholders' suits and suits by or against the members of labor unions or other unincorporated associations were true class actions. b. Hybrid Class Action 186 A hybrid class action was one in which the subject of the action was a specific fund or property, 
and the members of the class had separate rights therein e.g. suit on behalf of numerous co-owners of an oil well against a drilling company to enforce a royalty contract. A judgment in such an action was conclusive upon the rights of all members in the specific fund or property involved, but did not otherwise affect or bind class members not before the court. Dickinson v. Burnham, 197 F2 D973 2D Sir, 1952. C. Spurious class action 1A 187. A spurious class action was one in which there was simply a common question of law or fact affecting all members of the class, and the claims of each member were separate. A judgment in such an action bound only those members of the class actually before the court. Accordingly, this was not really a class action, but rather a permissive joinder device. 2. Present Federal Rule 23 Women 188 In 1966, Rule 23 was completely revised, eliminating the distinctions above and providing that members of a class can sue or be sued with binding effect on the class as a whole. 3. State Courts 1E189 Most states have adopted the present Rule 23, sometimes with modifications. In California, the rule has been effectively adopted by judicial decisions. Vasquez v. Superior Court, 4 Cal, 3D 81971. 4. Class Action Fairness Act 1 on 190. The Class Action Fairness Act expanded federal court subject matter jurisdiction to include certain class actions that present claims based on state law C. Supra, 284 at SEC. In addition, the Act provides additional protections and limitations regarding the settlement of class actions that are applicable to all class actions in federal court. C. Infra, 1306-1310. 3. Prerequisites to Class Action 1D191 Under Federal Rule 23A, all four of the following conditions must be established in any type of class suit. All class actions must also fit into one of the categories of Rule 23B Infra, 1D217-1239. I. Numerous parties the class must be so numerous that joinder of all members individually is impractical Rule 23A1. Roman 2. Common question. The action must involve questions of law or fact common to the class rule 23A2. Roman 3. Representatives claims typical the claims or defenses of the persons maintaining the action on behalf of the class must be typical of those of the class, generally rule 23A3. And Roman 4. Adequacy of representation. The persons representing the class must be able fairly and adequately to protect the interests of all members of the class Rule 23 of 4. A. Numerous Parties Requirement 1A 192. As indicated by the treatment of the real party in interest problem C. Supra. Woody 25 1056. Ordinarily litigation is to be conducted by the persons whose rights are involved as named parties. Only where they are too numerous to be joined is class treatment considered necessary. 1. No fixed minimum 1A 193. There is no fixed minimum number required to make a class too numerous for joinder of all members individually. Some cases have held 25 enough, while others have held that 39 is not enough. If the number is 50 or less, whether a class will be permitted usually turns on the following factors. And note that the trial court has considerable discretion in this matter de Marco v. Edens, 390 F2D 836 2D Sir, 1968. I. The size of each member's claim the smaller the claim, the more likely a class suit will be allowed. Roman 2. The practical likelihood that individual suits will be brought the lower the likelihood, the more likely a class suit will be allowed. Roman 3. The public importance of the right being enforced the greater the public importance, the more likely a class action will be permitted. And Roman 4. The geographic location of class members, the more difficult the geographic location makes it for class members to intervene, the more likely a class suit will be allowed. Example. 
In a case involving a price-fixing conspiracy, the district court found a proposed class of 350 members not numerous enough to justify a class action. The claims involved were large and, based on the district judge's prior experience with decision of such claims, he found that the claims could best be handled by intervention and individual participation. American Pipe and Construction Co. v. Utah, 414 U.S., 538, 1974. 2. No fixed maximum 1 is 194. Similarly, there is no fixed maximum size for a class action. In Eisen v. Carlisle and Jacqueline, Supra, 230. For example, the court dealt with a class of 6 million members, and while it put severe limitations on the class action, discussed below, it did not disqualify it as a class action because of its size. More recently, a lower court described a class action against tobacco companies on behalf of all nicotine-dependent smokers as the largest class action ever attempted in federal court. Castano v. The American Tobacco Co. 84F3D 734 5th Sir. 1996. A. Limitation class must be manageable 1 on 195. In actions brought under Rule 23b3 i.e. cases where questions of law or fact common to the class predominate. C. Infra. 1 in 225 1 in 31. The likely difficulties in managing a class action is one of the factors that the court must consider in deciding whether to permit the case to proceed as a class action. The larger the class, the greater the problems of manageability are likely to be. b. Limitation Notice Requirements 1e196 In some class suits, all identifiable members of the class must be given individual notice of the action, and the larger the class, the more cumbersome and expensive this becomes. Three. Need for Ascertainable Class 1E197 The class must be defined with sufficient clarity that its members can be identified. Rationale If the class action is successful, it is necessary to know who is entitled to relief under the court's decree. And if the class action is not successful, it is necessary to know who is bound by the class's loss. This concern may be less important in actions for injunctive relief under Rule 23b2c infra, 1n223 1 1n224, 1 because injunctive relief can be fashioned without knowing the identities of all class members. Yaf v. Powers, 454 F2d 1d362 1 1st Sir, 1972. 4. Minimum number of class members for Class Action Fairness Act Jurisdiction, 10198. Under the Class Action Fairness Act, Special jurisdictional provisions apply to certain state law class actions, permitting them to be filed in federal court C. Supra, 392-402 under the Act. These jurisdictional provisions are available only if the class has more than 100 members. 28 U.S.C. 1332-D5-B B. Common Question Requirement 1N199 There must be Questions of law or fact common to the class. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23 A. 2 Rationale. Unless there is some common question, there would be no efficiencies to be achieved by adjudicating the rights of the class members in a single proceeding. Example. In a securities fraud action where defendant made separate representations to various groups of investors, the common question requirement was satisfied because defendant engaged in a common and consistent course of conduct. Green v. Wolf Corp. 406 F2D 291 2D Sir. 1968. 1. Predominance of common questions 1 in 200. In actions brought under Rule 23b3 i.e. cases where questions of law or fact common to the class predominate. See Infra. 1 on 225 1 in 231. There must not only be a common question, but also common questions must predominate. Under Rule 23A2, on the other hand, predominance is not required. 2. Fact question needed 1 in 201. As a practical matter, it is usually essential that the common question have factual content that would make common litigation desirable. 3. 
Distinguish permissive joinder wanting to under two. Ordinarily, a closer factual connection is required to satisfy the class action common question requirement than the common question requirement for permissive joinder. See Supra, 179. 4. Problem of individual damages, 1203. If class members have suffered individual damages, that presents individual as opposed to class questions. However, the need to assess individual damages will not always prevent a class action because there may also be common questions regarding liability. 5. Problem of variation in state law, 1204. If the claims asserted in a class action are based on state law, and class members live in a number of states with varying laws, common questions might not be present because the factual questions to be resolved turn on different legal principles. C. Castano v. The American Tobacco Co. Supra the court may not homogenize the law of various states to overcome this problem. In re Roan Poulenc Rohr, Inc., 51 F3D 1 in 293 7th Sir, 1995 in some cases. However, the laws of the various states will fit into a few patterns so that recurrent common questions are presented. In re-school asbestos litigation, 789 F2D 996 3D Sir, 1986 state laws fit into four basic categories, and the jury could return verdicts based on the four legal standards. C. Typical Claim Requirement 1 in 205 The claims of the representative suing on behalf of the class must be typical of the class generally. Rationale Because the class representative acts on behalf of others, the court wishes to be assured that she will have the same objectives as the class members and sufficient motivation to protect their interests. This should flow from the fact that her claim makes her typical of the class members. C. Gonzalez v. Cassidy 474 F2D 67 5th Sir. 1973. Example. A Mexican-American employee who challenged the denial of a promotion was not typical of a class of Mexican-American job applicants who had not been hired, even though he alleged that the job applicants had, like him, been discriminated against on grounds of national origin. His claim of denial of a promotion in a specific instance was not typical of the claims of job applicants who were not hired. General Telephone Co. of the Southwest v. Falcon, 457 U.S., 147 1982. 1. Size of claim relevant 1 in 206. The size of the representative plaintiff's personal claim is relevant to the issue of whether she is properly motivated to protect the interests of the class generally. Jenkins v. General Motors Corp. 354 F. Sup. 1940 D. Dell. 1973. 2. Distinguish common question requirement 1 in 207. The Supreme Court has observed that the commonality and typicality requirements of Rule 23 attend to merge. Both serve as guideposts for determining whether under the particular circumstances maintenance of a class action is economical and whether the named plaintiff's claim and the class claims are so interrelated that the interests of the class members will be fairly and adequately protected in their absence. General Telephone Co. of the Southwest v. Falcon, Supra. 3. Effective mootness of representatives claim 1 in 208. When the class representative's claim becomes moot, it may be necessary to locate a new class representative who has a live claim. See United States Parole Commission v. Jarity, 445 U.S., 388 1980 named plaintiff, whose claim expires before certification, may be unable to continue as class representative. Sosna v. Iowa, 419 U.S., 393-1975 class representative, whose claim expired allowed to continue representing class. D. Adequate representation requirement, 1 in 209. This requirement is similar to the typical claim requirement, but also focuses on whether there is any actual or potential conflict of interest between the representative and the class she seeks to represent, and whether the representative can prosecute or defend the suit with adequate vigor and resources. 1. Constitutional Requirement 1 in 210 
Due process requires that the class representative not have interests adverse to members of the class. Example. Whites seeking to enforce a racially restrictive covenant forbidding sale of houses in area to blacks could not represent black who desired to buy a house in area. Hansberry v. Lee, 311 U.S., 32 1940. 2. Future v.s. Present personal injury tort claimants, 1 in 211. At least in the tort claimants context. The Supreme Court has implied that those who presently have claims for current injuries are not adequate representatives of those who may in the future fall ill, because those with current claims would want to maximize payouts presently, while those who may fall ill in the future would want to preserve resources for later compensation. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, 521 U.S., 591-1997. 3. Present V.S. Past employees 1212. A union representing airline stewardesses in challenging the airline's policy of discharging pregnant stewardesses could not adequately represent former stewardesses who had been discharged on this ground and were seeking reinstatement because their reinstatement might harm those currently employed, thus creating a potential conflict of interest. Airline Stewards Association v. American Airlines 490F2D 636 7th Sir. 1973. 4. Failure to object does not bar later objection. 1 and 2 at 13. If the representative does not meet the adequate representation requirement, but no one objects and the action proceeds to judgment, the judgment can be attacked by an absent member of the class on the ground that his interests were not adequately represented. Hansberry v. Lee Supra and this is true, even if the court hearing the class suit expressly found the representative to be adequate. 5. Time when adequate representation measured 1 and 2 and 14. The adequacy of representation can be measured at two different times. i. Prior to certifying the action as a class action, the judge must believe that the named plaintiff will furnish an adequate representation of the class members. Roman 2. After a class action ends, if an unnamed class member sues the party that was the defendant in the class action, and the defendant argues that the plaintiff should be bound by the result of the class action, the court will evaluate whether the representation in the class action was in fact adequate. If not, the unnamed plaintiff will not be bound. Gonzalez v. Cassidy, Supra, 1 in 205. 6. Decertification 1 in 215. Another possibility is that the court will determine, after deciding that the case is a proper class action, that the class representative is not adequate. In that situation, the court can decertify the class and change the case back into an individual action. 7. Subclasses 1 in 216. If an action is otherwise properly brought as a class action, but there is a significant divergence of interest among segments of the overall class. The court may divide the class into subclasses, appoint a representative for each subclass, and allow the suit to proceed in that manner. Ancom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra. 4. Three grounds for class actions, 1 in 217. If the foregoing conditions are all present, the class action may be based on any one of the following grounds. Fed, R, Civ, P, 23B. A. Prejudice from separate actions, 1 and 218. Under Federal Rule 23B1, a class action is permitted if the prosecution of separate actions would create either of the following risks. 1. Establishing incompatible standards of conduct for defendant through inconsistent adjudications 1 and 2 or 19. To justify a class action on this ground, the court must find that a number of individual actions are otherwise likely to be filed, and that the conduct required of the defendant under various judgments might be inconsistent. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23B1A. Larionoff v. United States. 533 F2D 1 in 167 DC, Sir. 1976. Examples. 
Paradigm examples of proper actions under this part of the rule are actions by taxpayers to invalidate municipal action or by stockholders to compel the declaration of a dividend. In such situations, there is a risk that other similarly situated plaintiffs might sue to compel defendants to take a different course of action e.g. to proceed with the intended municipal action or to withhold a dividend. A. Note. There is no such risk of inconsistency where injured parties are simply seeking damages for separate tort claims arising out of a single occurrence. The fact that the defendant might be held liable in one case and not liable in another is not enough to justify a class action on this basis. McDonnell Douglas Corp. v. District Court, 523 F2D 1083 9th Sir, 1975. 2. Substantially impairing the interests of other members of the class, 1820. To permit a class action under this subsection, the court must find that separate actions would interfere with the interests of other absent persons having similar claims. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23b1b. Examples. I one of several beneficiaries of a trust sues the trustee for an accounting and distribution which would affect the interests of all the beneficiaries. Redmond v. Commerce Trust Co. 144 F2D 148 Sir. 1944 Dealman 2 One of numerous claimants to a fund that is not sufficient to pay all claims seeks recovery since satisfaction of any single claim in full would impair others. Bradford Trust Co. v. Wright, 70 FRD, 323 EDNY, 1976. A. Limited Fund, Mass Tort Situation 1 in 21. An increasingly important occasion for invoking this part of the rule is the situation in which it is claimed that a large number of tort plaintiffs have claims exceeding the assets and insurance of the manufacturer of goods or services that injured them. In this situation, the concern is that if the first successful plaintiffs recover full damages, there will not be sufficient assets left to pay compensation to later plaintiffs. The courts have resisted allowing class actions in this situation. C. E.G. In Re Northern District of California, Dalk and Shield, Hold Products Liability Litigation. 693 F2D 847 9th Sir. 1982 Cert. Denied. 459 U.S. 1 E.W.E. 71 1983, the Supreme Court has held that a limited fund class action is not permitted when the limitation on the fund is the result of the party's settlement agreement, as opposed to being limited by law or by the funds actually available. But it has not ruled definitively on whether other limited fund class actions might be allowed. Ortiz v. Fiberboard Corp. 527 U.S. 815 1999 Fund, created by settlement among plaintiff class, counsel, defendant, and its insurers not acceptable even though agreement provides that claims must be asserted against this fund. b. Equitable relief, sought as to rights held in common 1 and 2 22. Under Federal Rule 23b2, a class action is also warranted if the basis on which the opposing party has acted is generally applicable to the class and declaratory or injunctive relief would benefit the class as a whole. Example. Plaintiff sues on equal protection grounds to invalidate a statutory provision that divorce actions can be maintained only by persons who have resided in the state for at least a year. The effects on particular members of the class in question persons who have resided in the state less than a year may vary. But a class action is proper because the determination will benefit the class as a whole. Sosna v. Iowa, Supra, 1 in 208. 1. Problem of monetary relief, 1 in 223. In some cases, monetary relief may be sought as well as injunctive relief. When the amounts due to class members can be calculated by a formula or on principles uniformly and easily applicable to the class, Courts sometimes allow certification of hybrid B2 classes. When individualized determination of money damages is involved, however, this route is held improper. Rice v. City of Philadelphia, 66 FRD, 17 ED, PA, 1974. 2. 
Caution Title Roman 7 Employment Discrimination Class Actions 1 and 2 24 because back pay awards in Title Roman VII cases involving employment discrimination were considered equitable, courts considered them suitable for certification under Rule 23b-2, even though they involved monetary claims. But in 1991, Congress amended Title Roman VII to permit recovery of compensatory and punitive damages, and it has been held that certification under Rule 23b-2 is not proper as a result. Allison v. Sitco Petroleum Corp. 151 F3D 402 5th Sir. 1998. C. Common Predominant Question. 1 in 2 25. The third and most common basis for a class suit is under Federal Rule 23b 3 the situation in which questions of law or fact common to the class predominate over questions affecting only individual members. And, on balance, a class action is superior to other available methods for adjudicating the controversy. The Supreme Court has called this provision the most adventuresome innovation in the 1966 amendments to Rule 23. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra, 1 in 211. 1. Relevant Factors 1 on 2 26. In deciding whether common issues predominate and whether a class action is superior, to individual litigation, the court will consider i. The interest of individual members in personally controlling their cases. Roman 2. The nature and extent of any litigation in progress involving the same controversy. Roman 3. The desirability of consolidating all claims in a single action before a single court. And Roman 4. Any probable difficulties managing a class action. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23b3. 2. Predominance of common questions. 1 and 2. 27. To find that common questions predominate, the court must compare the relative importance of the common questions and the individual questions presented by the case. It cannot merely compare the number of common and individual questions. Damages. For example, may present individual questions as to each class member, but may not defeat a finding that common questions predominate. Instead, the court is to determine whether the common questions are so important to the resolution of the lawsuit, and whether they will occupy sufficient time and effort in the resolution of the case, that it may fairly be said that they predominate over individual questions. a. Existence of Common Issue 1 in 2 and 28 it is important to focus carefully on whether there really is a common factual issue. For example, in many products liability cases, it may be that the common issue regarding liability can be stated only in the most general terms, because so much depends on the individual circumstances of each plaintiff. In such cases, one may conclude that there really is no common factual issue. C. E. G. Mertens v. Abbott Laboratories, 99 FRD. 38 DNH, 1983 in action against manufacturer of DES, allegedly common issue of defendant's knowledge of risks of DES, not important, since there is nothing to show that knowledge at a given point in time essentially settles anything with respect to liability of a particular claimant. B. Single Issue Certification, 1 and 2 29. The existence of numerous and important individual issues can be partly solved by certifying the class action as to certain issues only. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23C4 However, it is unlikely that this device may properly be used to circumvent the requirement of predominance of common questions, and in most instances the court should hesitate to sidestep the problem of predominance by limiting the class action aspects to common issues. C. Maturity Factor in Tort Class Actions 1 in 230 In mass tort class actions, courts have resisted finding that there is a predominant common issue where the claim is of a new and untested sort. Castano v. The American Tobacco Co. Supra 1 in 94 claim that tobacco companies were liable for addicting smokers new and untested. In re Roan Pool Inc. Roarer, Inc. Supra one in two of four claims by HIV-positive hemophiliacs against producers of blood solids on theory that heat treatment of blood solids designed to remove risk of hepatitis 
would also eliminate HIV risk however. In situations where the court is well familiar with the claims, this problem is not present. Jenkins v. Raymark Industry, Inc., 782 F2D 316 5th Sir, 1986, state-of-the-art issue in asbestos litigation very familiar to court due to number of trials that had already addressed it. D. Variation in State Law, 1E231. In Rule 23b3 Class Actions, the problems of variation in applicable state laws see supra. 1 and 226 are compounded because the common questions must predominate. 3. Manageability and superiority 1 and 232. Assuming common issues predominate, the court must also ask whether a class action would be manageable and whether it would be superior to other methods of adjudicating the case. A. Comparative analysis 1 and 233. It is important to understand that manageability is only one factor in evaluating superiority. Accordingly, the fact that the case will be difficult to manage as a class action does not necessarily preclude a finding that handling the case as a class action is superior to other methods of adjudicating the dispute. Only in the most extreme instances would problems of manageability alone be decisive in evaluating superiority. Example Class Action Superior in litigation brought on behalf of thousands of military personnel exposed to the defoliant Agent Orange in Southeast Asia, the court recognized that it confronted massive problems of manageability. Nevertheless, it compared the difficulties presented by handling the case as a class action with the enormous problems of handling the litigation as individual cases, and concluded that class action treatment had advantages over the other methods. In Reagent Orange Product Liability Litigation, 506 F. Sup. 762 EDNY. 1980. Example Class Action, Not Manageable. A suit on behalf of all residents of Los Angeles County over 7 million persons to enjoin 293 large industrial companies from further pollution of the atmosphere was dismissed as unmanageable because of the number of parties, the diversity of their interests and the multiplicity of issues involved. Diamond v. General Motors Corp. 20 Cal. App. 3D 374-1971. b. Effect of Settlement 1 in 234. A settlement that makes a trial unnecessary may remove manageability obstacles that were present when the case was proceeding as a litigation class action. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor. Supra 1D216, and see below. 4. Mass tort class actions under Rule 23B3 1D235. In 1966, the advisory committee included a note cautioning against use of class actions in mass accident cases on the ground that individual issues would predominate, and the cases would degenerate in practice into multiple lawsuits separately tried. Fed. R. Civ. P. At A. Com. Note nevertheless, since the 1970s, courts have certified such cases despite the note, and the Supreme Court has recognized this trend with seeming acceptance. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra, the text of the rule does not categorically exclude mass tort cases from class certification, and district courts, since the late 1970s, have been certifying such cases in increasing number. D. Certification for settlement, only 1D236. A court need not conclude that it would certify a class for all purposes, including full trial, in order to approve class certification for the purpose of effectuating a proposed class settlement. The prospect of settlement has on occasion prompted courts to certify cases for settlement discussions only. 1. Criticism 1E237 a lawyer representing a class only with regard to a possible settlement is without significant leverage because she is unable to threaten to proceed to full litigation if settlement demands are not met. Moreover, the defendant may be tempted to shop among prospective class counsel to locate one willing to accept a settlement along the lines defendant wants to embody in a court decree. This risk is sometimes described as a reverse auction. Rule 23 empowers the court to appoint interim counsel in part as a method for dealing with this risk.
and also directs class counsel to act in the best interests of the class. Fed. R. Sif. P. 23G3. 4. A. But note. The Supreme Court has recognized that settlement classes are sometimes permissible. See Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Super Rationale. The court has at least some role in selecting counsel, who will negotiate on behalf of the class, if it certifies for purposes of settlement only, even if the case cannot proceed to trial. 2. Requirements for Certification for Settlement, 1 in 238. When certifying a class for settlement only, the court may overlook the likely difficulties of managing a trial. But the judge must still find that all of the Rule 23a prerequisites C supra, 1 and we are 91 1 in 2 at 16 have been satisfied, and that the case falls within one of the Rule 23b categories. Subclassing may be necessary to assure adequate representation under Rule 23a 4 in the case of a large and disparate class. And in classes certified under Rule 23b-3, the fact of settlement does not supersede the rule's requirement that common issues predominate. C. Ortiz v. Fiberboard Corp. Supra, 1 and 2, 21. Ancom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra. E. Application of different grounds to same case 1 in 239. In a given case, the plaintiff may try to satisfy different parts of Rule 23b in the alternative, and the case may be certified as to certain matters on one ground, while certification is denied as to other parts. Example. Plaintiffs charged that the Philadelphia police illegally detained persons accused of crimes for as long as 20 hours without food or medical care, and sought declaratory, injunctive, and compensatory relief on behalf of a class. The court certified a class with respect to declaratory and injunctive relief under Rule 23b-2, but held that the action could not be certified under Rule 23b-3 with respect to damages. Rice v. City of Philadelphia, Supra, 1 and 2, 23. 5. Jurisdictional Requirements in Class Suits a. Subject Matter Jurisdiction, 1 in 240. In Class Actions in Federal Court not involving federal claims. Subject matter jurisdiction issues may arise. 1. Diversity of citizenship, 1 in 241. For purposes of federal diversity jurisdiction, only the citizenship of the representative is considered. This facilitates maintenance of a class suit in federal court. Note also that the named representatives must also meet the requirements of venue. Supreme Tribe of Ben Hervey, Cobble, Supra, 344. 2. Jurisdictional Amount 1 and 242. Until adoption of the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute, the rule had been that in any class action in which the individual class members would be entitled to separate recoveries rather than a recovery in common. When the amount in controversy requirement applied, each member of the class had to have a claim for more than $75,000. Zon v. International Paper Co. Supra, 453 refusal to allow ancillary jurisdiction when class representatives' claims satisfied jurisdictional amount requirement. But the claims of unnamed members of the class did not the effect of the ZON requirement had been to exclude from federal court most diversity class actions, such as consumer class actions based on state law, because the claims of each member in such cases usually do not exceed $75,000. A. Impact of Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute 1 in 2 43. The Supreme Court has held that the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute 28 U.S.C. 23 67 overrules Zon, allowing supplemental jurisdiction over claims of unnamed members of a plaintiff class in a diversity class action, even when those claims do not exceed $75,000. Exxon Mobil Corp. v. Alapata Services, Inc. Supra, 469 however. This holding has no effect on the rule that the separate claims of individual class members cannot be aggregated to satisfy the $75,000 amount in controversy requirement for original jurisdiction. Snyder v. Harris, 394 U.S. 
332-1969 no aggregation of legally separate claims to satisfy jurisdictional amount requirement note. However, that the Class Action Fairness Act C below allows plaintiffs to aggregate their claims under certain circumstances. b. Class Action Fairness Act 1E244 The Class Action Fairness Act provides for federal court jurisdiction for class actions that are based on state law. If the aggregate claims asserted on behalf of the class exceed $5 million jurisdictions, so long as the class has more than 100 members and there is minimal diversity. 28 U.S.C. 1332 D6 B. Personal Jurisdiction 1A245 It has been held that in an action involving a nationwide class, a state court could assert personal jurisdiction over absent members of the plaintiff class if they were afforded an opportunity to opt out and chose not to do so. Phillips Petroleum Co. v. Schutz, 472 U.S. 797-1985 1. Requirement of right to opt out 1246 It is unclear whether the right to opt out is required to justify personal jurisdiction in all cases, such as actions brought under Rule 23b1 or 23b2. The Supreme Court reserved ruling on this point in Schatz Supra and has since declined to decide whether a right to opt out is required. C. Adams v. Robertson, 520 U.S., 83 1997 Certorari dismissed in case raising issue. 2. Defendant Classes 1 in 247. It is also unclear whether the same analysis would apply to a defendant class when the right to opt out was afforded the unnamed members of the class. 6. Procedure in conducting class suits. a. Certification, hearing 1 in 248. At an early practicable time, after the filing of an alleged class suit, the court must determine whether to certify the action as a class action. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23C1A This determination is commonly called class certification. If the court concludes that class certification is not proper, the suit may be continued as an individual action. 1. Based on evidence 1 in 2 e 49. In determining whether the suit can proceed as a class action, the court can take evidence on any of the issues raised i.e. it is not restricted to the pleadings. a. Discovery on class certification 1 in 250. Because the class certification decision is to be based on evidentiary materials, it is said to be necessary to allow pre-certification discovery relevant to whether the case should be certified as a class action. Stewart v. Winter, 669 F2D 328 5th Sir, 1982 Some courts try to limit this to class action issues, as distinguished from merits issues going to the merits of the case. But this may prove difficult since commonality and typicality are class certification issues that depend in large measure on merits information. 2. Consideration of merits for class certification, 1 in 251. The Supreme Court has stated that the court may not make a preliminary inquiry into the merits of the suit to decide whether it can be maintained as a class action. Eisen v. Carlisle and Jacqueline, Supra. 1 in 194. A. Distinguish determining whether claims satisfies Rule 23 1 in 252. The court may, however, determine whether the claim is of a type that would satisfy Rule 23, and to do so it must examine the grounds for the action to identify common issues and decide whether the plaintiff has a typical claim. One court said that the court should look between the pleading and the fruits of discovery. Enough must be laid bare to let the judge survey the factual scene on a kind of sketchy relief map, leaving for later view the myriad of details that cover the terrain. Zero to V. Solitron Devices, Inc. 673 F2D 566 2D Sir. Cert. Denied. 459 U.S. 838 1982. 3. Precertification Decision of Merits. 1 in 253. The premise of the 1966 amendments to Rule 23 was that the class action would be binding on all class members, whether or not it was successful. Otherwise, class members could benefit from one-way intervention, 
finding out how the merits were decided before they elected to remain in the action or to opt out. As a result, it was widely assumed that the court could not decide the merits until it ruled on the certification issue. But the courts have modified this view see below. However, where the certification process was likely to be protracted and expensive, it might give a plaintiff who added class action allegations to his groundless complaint undue settlement leverage to prevent defendants from attacking the merits of the case until certification was decided. A. Motions to dismiss 1254. To counteract the risk that plaintiffs will add class action allegations to groundless complaints, courts generally will entertain motions to dismiss under Rule 12b6c Supra. 756 before certification is decided. b. Summary judgment motions 1 in 255. Many courts will also allow defendants to move for summary judgment. The theory to support this is that defendants can waive the rule's protection against one-way intervention by filing motions for summary judgment if they choose to. Cohen v. Bank United of Texas, 70 F3D 937 7th Sir. 1995. 4. Certification order may be modified 1 in 256. The certification order is only tentative. At any time before trial, the court may revise class certification, if it decides changes are necessary, by decertifying or altering the class configuration. Indeed, it may expand class size even after judgment, if this would not unfairly subject the defendant to liability. Payne v. Travanol Laboratories, Inc., 673 F2D 798 Fifth Sir, Cert. Denied. 459 U.S. 1938 1982. 5. Immediate Appellate Review of Certification Decisions, 1 in 257. Rule 23 provides for interlocutory appellate review of orders granting or denying class status. Fed. R. Sif. 23F The Court of Appeals has discretion to entertain such an immediate appeal if a party applies for review within 10 days after entry of the order. b. Appointment of Class Counsel 1D258 If the court certifies a class, it must also appoint class counsel at the time of certification. Fed. R. Sif. p. 23C1BG. 1. Criteria for appointment 1 in 259. The court must consider the work counsel has done investigating possible claims in the action, counsel's experience with complex litigation, and the type of claim asserted, counsel's knowledge of the applicable law, and the resources counsel will commit to representing the class. The court may also consider any other pertinent matter. Fed. R. Sif. P. 23G1. A. Multiple applicants 1 in 260. When there are multiple applicants to be class counsel, the court should select the one best able to represent the class. If there is only one applicant, the court may appoint that applicant only if adequate. Fed. R. Sip. P. 23G2. 2. Terms for possible attorneys. Fee award 1 in 261. The court may direct applicants for class counsel to propose terms for an attorney's fee award and may include provisions about a possible fee award in the order of appointment. Fed. R. Sif. P. 23 G1D. 3. Duty of class counsel 1 on 262. Class counsel must fairly and adequately represent the interests of the class. Fed. R. Sif. P. 23 G4. 4. Interim Class Counsel 1D263. The court may designate interim class counsel to act on behalf of the class during the period before class certification. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23G3. C. Statute of Limitations 1E264. The filing of a suit as a class action suspends the running of the statute of limitations for all putative members of the class until class certification is decided. American Pipe and Construction Co. The Utah Supra 1E193 Rationale Unless they could rely on the pendency of the class action to protect their rights, 
Unnamed members of the class would have to file their own suits to guard against the running of the limitations period. This would defeat the purpose of Rule 23 to achieve the efficient combined resolution of cases suitable for class action treatment. 1. Effect 1D265 From the date, the class action is filed until class certification is decided. The running of limitations is suspended. If class certification is denied, the limitations period begins to run again, and class members have the remainder of the period to file their own actions or intervene. Nelson v. County of Allegheny, 60 F3D 1010 3D Sir, 1995 tolling ceased when district court denied class certification. If class certification is granted, class members who remain in the class action are protected against a limitations defense, provided the class action was filed in time. 2. Opt-outs 1 in 266. If class certification is granted and some class members opt out, the limitations period begins to run again, and they must file individual actions to protect themselves against the running of limitations. 3. Tolling not dependent on grounds for denial 1D267. The suspension of the running of the limitations period applies, even if the class certification motion is denied for lack of commonality or typicality. Crown, Cork and Seal Co. v. Parker, 462 U.S. 345 1983 Criticism This means that the defendant is really not on notice of the claims that are protected from the running of limitations by the filing of the defective class action. 4. Defendant Class Actions 1E268 The suspension of limitations has been held to apply to a defendant class action in which the unnamed member of the defendant class did not even have notice of the filing of the suit within the limitations period. Appleton Electric Co. v. Graves Truck Line, Inc., 635 F2D 603 7th Sir. 1980, Cert. Denied, 451 U.S., 9 and 76, 1981. 5. Successive Class Actions, 1 in 269. The suspension of limitations has been held not to be available in a second class action that is timely only because a deficient class action earlier suspended the running of limitations. Bash v. Ground Round, Inc., 139 F3D 6 1st Sir, 1998. D. Notice Requirements. 1. When notice to individual class members is discretionary 1 in 270. If the basis for a class action is to avoid the risk of inconsistent adjudications fed, R. Sif. P. 23 B. 1 A. Supra. 1 in 2 and 18, or the claim is for injunctive or declaratory relief for the class as a whole fed. R. Civ. P. 23b2. The appropriate form of notice to class members is left to the discretion of the court. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23c2a. 23d1b individual notice to class members is not required by due process if the class representation is adequate. Wetzel v. Liberty Mutual Insurance Co. 508 F2D 239 3D Sir. 1975. 2. When individual notice is mandatory. A. Damages Class Action 1 in 2 and 71. In a damages class action based on a predominant question common to the class fed. R. Civ. P. 23B3 Supra. 1 and 2 26. Members of the class must be given the best notice practicable under the circumstances, including individual notice to all members who can be identified through reasonable effort. Eisen v. Carlisle and Jacqueline, Supra, 1E would you 94 requiring individual notice to two 250,000 class members. Fed, R, Civ, P, 23C2B. B, Settlement or Dismissal 1E 272. Once a suit has been certified as a class suit, some type of notice to the class is required before any type of class action may be settled or dismissed. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23E1. C. State rules may be more flexible 1 and 2 and 73. State courts usually require individual notice 
only where members of the class have substantial claims. Because in such cases, it is essential for them to decide whether to remain in and be bound by res judicata or opt out and pursue their independent remedies. Where the membership of the class is large and damages to each member small, individual notice might not be required and notice by publication may be sufficient. Cooper v. American Savings and Loan Association, 55 Cal, App, 3D 274 1976. 3. Form and Content of Notice 1 and 274. Federal Rule 23 does not establish any specific form or manner of giving notice. A. Form 1T275. Clearly, the notice itself need not be in the form of a complaint or summons. Letters, bulletins, or circulars mailed to members of the class are commonly used. However, when notice to each member is mandatory, it must be given at least the formality of mail. Eisen v. Carlisle and Jacqueline, Supra in other instances, the court has discretion as to form. Greenfield v. Villager Industries, Inc., 483 F2D 824 3D Sir, 1973. B. Contents 1 and 276. The notice must use plain, easily understood language to advise the class members of the existence of the suit, the nature of the claim and relief requested, provisions for costs of maintaining the suit, and the identity of the person or persons suing on behalf of the class. When based on Rule 23b3 the predominant common question ground, it must also advise each member that he will be bound by the judgment unless he opts out. Fed. R. Civi. P. 23c2b. C. Effective Notice 1e277. In the ordinary civil action, notice has the effect of making the notified person a party to the action who will be bound by any judgment in the action including a default judgment if he does not appear. In a class suit, however, the notified person is already provisionally bound through representation by the class representative. Hence, notice has the following effects. 1. If accompanied by an opt-out directive in a Rule 23b3 suit, the notice allows the notified person to terminate his involvement in the action C infra. 1d280. 2. In other types of class suits, the notice a. gives absent members of the class the opportunity to intervene and protect themselves, and b. gives the opposing party more assurance that the eventual judgment cannot subsequently be attacked by an absentee claiming that the representation was inadequate c. supra. 1 and 2 of 13. 4. Plaintiff must pay costs of notice 1 and 2 at 78. Under Rule 23c, the plaintiff initially must pay the costs of notifying all members of the class. Eisen v. Carlisle and Jacqueline. Supra, if the plaintiff wins the action, she can ultimately recover such expenses from the defendant as necessary court costs. a. Cost of identifying class members 1 and 2 79. The plaintiff must also pay the costs of identifying class members. Oppenheimer Fund, Inc. V. Sanders, 437 U.S. 340 16000 in computer costs to identify certain class members properly charged to plaintiff. B. Effect. The cost of notice has inhibited large class actions in federal court. Because the larger the class, the less likely it is that any single plaintiff can afford to bear the costs of notice and thus fairly and adequately represent the class. E. Opting out by class members 1 in 280. In class actions under Rule 23b3, unnamed members of the class may opt out, thereby excluding themselves from the binding effects of the class action. 1. Timing 1 in 281. Usually the decision to opt out must be made before the court decides the merits, to avoid the risk of one-way intervention. C. Supra 1 in 253. 2. Effect on Statute of Limitations 1 in 282. Once a class member opts out, she loses the class action's effect of suspending the limitations period and must file her own suit within the remainder of the limitations period to protect her rights. 
C. Supra, 1 in 264. 3. Rule 23b1 and 23b2 Class Actions, 1 in 283. There is no mandatory opt-out right in the rule for actions under Rule 23b1 or 23b2. In some cases, the court may, in its discretion, permit opting out. But that could undermine the purpose of certifying a case of this type in the first place. When class members have monetary claim, however, it may be an abuse of discretion to deny the right to opt out. Holmes v. Continental Can Co. 706 F 2D 1244 11th Sir. 1983. 4. Constitutional Right Argument 1 in 284. It may be argued that the Supreme Court's decision that the right to opt out permits exercise of personal jurisdiction over the claims of unnamed class members C. Supra. Wanting to 45 means that there must always be a right to opt out where unnamed class members are not subject to the personal jurisdiction of the court. 5. Right to claim collateral estoppel 1 in 285. It has been held that where class members opt out and the class action is successful, the opt-outs may not claim collateral estoppel i.e. claim that the issues decided against the defendant and the class action control here as well. That would be tantamount to one-way intervention. Betcher v. Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith, Inc. 193 F3D 415 6 Sir. 1999. Amadi v. City of Woodstock, 176 F3D 952 7 Sir. 1998. F. Intervention by class members 1 in 286. Intervention by class members in the class action is allowed on the same terms that govern intervention otherwise. C. Supra. 1 in 31 1 in 157. 1. Adequacy of representation 1 in 287. A problem arises from this rule, because intervention is not allowed where the intervener is adequately represented by the present litigant C. Supra. 1 in 239 and the court must find the class representative i.e., the present litigant adequate to certify the class C. Supra, 1 and 2 and 9. Some courts solve the problem by saying that the finding of adequacy under Rule 23a for class certification does not require a finding of adequacy under Rule 24a dealing with intervention. Woolen v. Sertran Taxicabs, Inc., 684 F2D 324 5th Sir, 1982. 2. Role of Intervenor 1 in 288 Rule 23 makes no provision for participation by a class member who is not the class representative. Some courts suggest that when intervention is proper, the certification decision should be reconsidered or the intervenor should be designated a new class representative. Lelsvi, Kavanaugh, 710 F2D 1 in 45th Sir, 1983 3. Entering an appearance 1 in 289. In Rule 23b3 actions, a class member may enter an appearance through an attorney. This does not entitle the class member to take an active role in the litigation, but rather only entitles the class member to receive copies of pleadings and other filings. It is, thus, a way to monitor the progress of the case. G. Discovery 1 in 290. Class members are treated as quasi-parties for discovery purposes. The opposing party is not given the full rights e.g. to depose each class member that he ordinarily has against opposing litigants. However, he can obtain fair discovery of the typicality of claims, the factual basis for determining inclusion in the class, individual damages, and the like. Interrogatories for these purposes are proper, as are depositions when necessary. Brennan v. Midwestern United Life Insurance Co. 450 F2D 999 7 Sir. 1971. H. Communications with class members 1 in 291. Courts are concerned about the risk that unnamed members of the class may be victimized by misleading or overreaching on the part of the litigants or their lawyers, and may therefore sometimes limit contacts with class members. 1. Showing of Need 1 in 292 The Supreme Court has held that limitations on communications with class members by class counsel may be imposed only where there is some showing of need. 
Gulf Oil Corp. v. Bernard, 452 U.S. 89 1981 The showing should indicate a likelihood of misleading or overreaching class members. 2. Effect of Certification 1 on 293 After the class is certified, class counsel is for some purposes the attorney for the class members, and the court's power to interfere with her communications is limited. 3. Communications by Class Opponent 1 in 294 After the class is certified, the court has broader authority to regulate communications by the class opponent, particularly when there is a risk that the class opponent will try to subvert the class action by pressuring class members to opt out. Example In a class action against a bank alleging that it defrauded its borrowers by inflating the prime rate it charged them, the court properly punished the bank for embarking on a campaign to have loan officers call class members and pressure them to opt out of the action. Kleiner v. First National Bank of Atlanta 751 F2D 1N 193 11th Sir 1985 A. Attorney contacts 1N 295 After certification, class members should be considered represented by counsel and the attorney for the class opponent is therefore forbidden by ethical rules to communicate with the class members. Riznik v. American Dental Association, 95 FRD, 372 ND, IL, 1982. 4. Remedies for Violations 1 and 296 When a valid rule against communication with class members is violated, the court may hold the person who violated the rule in contempt. In addition, when the communication resulted in opt-outs, the court can invalidate the opt-outs tainted by the communication. I. Dismissal and Compromise One. Court approval required 1D297. Because of the fiduciary nature of a class action, it may not be dismissed or settled by the class representative without court approval. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23. A. Fairness Inquiry does not substitute for satisfaction of Rule 23, A Requirements 1 on 298. In a class action that is settled, the Rule 23A prerequisites to a class action apply, even if the court finds that the proposed settlement is fair and adequate. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra, 1E211 Indeed. The fact that class counsel and defendants have reached a settlement without formal certification of a litigation class action may mean that the court should be more exacting with regard to questions of adequacy of representation and typicality. 2. Notice required 1299. Notice of the proposed dismissal or compromise must be given to all members of the class before the court can give its approval. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23E1. 3. Settlement before certification 1D300. If a class action is settled before certification, the notice and hearing requirements depend on the nature of the settlement. A. Settlement of class claims 1D301. If the settlement purports to resolve class claims, the settlement approval requirements of Rule 23 apply. The settlement may propose that a class be certified but the court must scrutinize class certification under Rules 23a and b and may not simply accept it because it is proposed by the parties. Amcom Products, Inc. v. Windsor, Supra besides evaluating class certification. The court must, when class claims are to be settled, perform a full examination of the fairness of the proposed settlement. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23. B. Settlement of Individual Claims 1 in 302 If the settlement purports to settle only the individual claims of the proposed class representatives, the court need not perform any fairness review. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23E Under Prior Law Most courts held that they should examine the individual settlement to determine whether there was an indication of abuse of the class action device or prejudice to absent class members. This review is no longer authorized. 4. Objections by Class Members 1 in 303 
Any class member may object that the settlement is not adequate, but an objection may be withdrawn only with court approval. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23C5. A. Appeal by Objector 1304. If the district court approves the proposed settlement despite objections, an objector may appeal the approval of the settlement without intervening in the case. Devlin v. Scartoletti, 536 U.S., 1 2002. 5. Possible second opt out 1305. The court may refuse to approve a settlement if the time for opting out has expired, unless class members are afforded a new opportunity to opt out. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23 4. For example, in Texas state courts, such a second opt out is mandatory in Rule 23b3 Common Question Class Actions. Text. R. Civ. P. 42e3. 6. Protections under the Class Action Fairness Act 1306. The Class Action Fairness Act adds a number of protections that apply to settlements in all class actions in federal court. A. Coupon Settlements 1307. Sometimes, class action settlements provide for class members to receive coupons good for purchase of further goods or services from the defendant. The court may approve such a settlement only after holding a hearing and making a finding that the settlement is fair, and it may also require that unclaimed coupons be distributed to charitable organizations if attorneys' fees in such cases are to be based on the value of the settlement to the class. They must be limited to the value of the coupons actually redeemed by class members, rather than the total amount available to class members. Alternatively, attorneys' fees can be based on the amount of time class counsel reasonably expended on the action. 28 U.S.C. 1712 b. Protection against loss by class members 1E308 In some consumer class actions, some class members have actually lost money because attorneys' fee awards required them to pay the lawyers more than they received from the settlement. A court may approve a settlement that would have that effect only if it makes a written finding that non-monetary benefits to the class member substantially outweigh the monetary loss. 28 U.S.C. 1713 C. Protection Against Discrimination Based on Geographic Location 1309 the court may not approve a settlement that provides larger payouts for some class members than others solely because the benefited class members are located closer to the court. 28 U.S.C. 1714 D. Notification of Federal and State Officials 1310 Settling defendants are required to give notice of proposed settlements to identified federal and state officials. Final approval of the proposed settlement may not be issued until at least 90 days after the notice is served. A class member who demonstrates that the required notice was not provided may choose not to be bound by the settlement. 28 U.S.C. 1715 J. Distribution of Proceeds of Action 1. Class members file individual claims 1 in 311. Ordinarily, any fund obtained by settlement or judgment in a class action will be held intact, and members of the class will be notified to file individual claims to establish their shares. 2. Rebate Approach 1312 However, when the class is numerous and the claims are small, this approach may be impractical. In this situation, some courts have adopted what amounts to a rebate approach where the identity of the class members at the time of the wrong cannot be determined or the amounts of their respective claims are very small, the recovery will be distributed to those persons who are now members of the class. Example, taxi fare overcharges to former customers may be refunded by reducing fares to future customers. C. Dar V. Yellow Cab Co. 67 Cal. 2D 695 1967. A. Criticism. This approach may distort market structure, resulting in temporary underpricing, overuse, and competitive advantage for the wrongdoer. K. Award of Attorneys Fees 1313. The court may award attorneys' fees as authorized by law 
or by the party's agreement. Fet. R. C. P. 23H. Although Rule 23H itself grants the court no authority to award fees to counsel in a successful class action. Federal and state courts generally award fees out of the proceeds recovered by the class. This is based on the court's inherent equity powers under the Common Fund Doctrine i.e., the plaintiff who hired the attorney should not be required to pay the entire amount of legal fees incurred in obtaining a common fund benefiting all class members. Mills v. Electric Auto Light Co. 396 U.S. 375 1970 In many instances, statutory fee-shifting provisions also provide a basis for a fee award in class actions as in other suits. However, the amount of the attorney's fee award must be carefully examined by the court to protect the interests of the class. 1. Made on Motion 1E314 A claim for an award of attorney's fees must be made by motion and notice of the motion must be directed to class members in a reasonable manner. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23H1. 2. Objections to Motion 1315. Any class member, or a party from whom payment is sought, may object to the motion. Fed. R. Civ. P. 23H2. 3. Coupon Settlements 1E316. The court may grant an attorney's fee award based on the value of coupons in a settlement of a class action, only to the extent that the coupons are redeemed by class members C. Supra. 28 U.S.C. 1712. 4. Protection against loss by class members 1317. A court may approve a class action settlement that would require some class members to pay more in attorney's fees than the benefits that they receive under the settlement only if it makes a written finding that the non-monetary benefits to the class members substantially outweigh the monetary loss C. Supra. 28 U.S.C. 1.713. 7. Effect of Judgment in Class Action 1.318. A central issue in class actions is whether the judgment binds members of the class who were not actually before the court. a. State Rules 1E319 Some states retain the distinctions between true, hybrid, and spurious class actions, the former federal rule, under which the nature of the action determines whether the judgment is binding on absentees. c. Supra 11,841,187 b. Federal Rule 1 under Federal Rule 23. However, these distinctions are eliminated. A valid judgment in any class action whether or not favorable to the class binds all members of the class who do not affirmatively request exclusion opt-out. A person who excludes herself from the action will not be bound by an adverse judgment. Conversely, however, she may be unable to assert collateral estoppel in her own action if the judgment turns out to be favorable to the class. C. Supra, 1 in 285. 8. Defendant Class Actions, 1 in 321. Rule 23 states that suits may be brought against a defendant class. For such actions, the rule does not provide any procedures different from those for actions on behalf of a plaintiff class. Nevertheless, the courts tend to approach defendant class actions differently in ways that should be noted. A. Adequacy of representation, 1 in 322. There is a risk that a plaintiff will select a weak representative for a defendant class. Adequacy of representation may therefore be examined more closely. 1. Incentive problem, 1 in 323. The defendant class representative may have less incentive to litigate vigorously, and the lawyer for the class lacks the entrepreneurial incentive of a plaintiff class lawyer who looks forward to a large fee award, if the case is successful. 2. Courts Attitude 1324 Despite these problems, many courts realize that defendants will try to escape service as class representative. The courts resist such efforts. Courts must not readily accede to the wishes of named defendants in this area, for to permit them to abdicate so easily would utterly vitiate the effectiveness of the defendant class action. Marsa Ravi, Chinlund, 
595 F2D1 and 231 2D Sir. Vacated on other grounds. 442 U.S. 915 1979 Hence. When the representatives will adequately protect the class by protecting their own interests. Courts will find them adequate. B. Qualitative differences between plaintiff and defendant postures. 1325. Many courts view defendant's stakes as qualitatively different. The distinction is that the unnamed plaintiff stands to gain while the unnamed defendant stands to lose. Tillens, Inc. v. Community Currency Exchange Association. 97 FRD. 668 ND. Ill. 1983. 1. Criticism. This represents a skewed view of litigation because both defendants and plaintiffs stand to lose and gain. The absent plaintiff class member who has a valid claim stands to lose if the class action is decided adversely, and the absent defendant class member stands to gain res judicata protection against future suits if the defendant class is successful. C. Rule 23b2 Class Actions, 1326. Rule 23b2 authorizes actions for injunctive or declaratory relief against the party opposing the class, seemingly precluding a defendant class action. Nevertheless, there is a division in the courts on whether it is permissible to have a class action seeking an injunction against a defendant class. See Marsara v. Chinlund, Super Defendant Class Allowed. Henson v. East Lincoln Township, 814 F2D 410 7th Sir. 1987 Defendant Class Not Allowed D. Personal Jurisdiction 1327 In upholding the authority of a state court to exercise personal jurisdiction over absent plaintiff class members C. Supra 1245 The Supreme Court distinguished the situation of defendants. For, an out-of-state defendant summoned by a plaintiff is faced with the full powers of the forum state against it. Phillips Petroleum Co. V. Schutz, Supra, wanting 245, it is uncertain whether this mandates granting unnamed defendant class members more than the right simply to opt out to overcome their personal jurisdiction objections. E. Bilateral class action, 1328. Some of the most troubling class action problems involve bilateral class actions, i.e., involving a plaintiff class suing a defendant class. One reaction of courts has been to hold that each plaintiff class member must have a claim against each defendant class member in such actions. La Marvie, H. and B. Novelty and Lone Co., 489 F2D 461 9th Sir. 1973, there are two principal ways to satisfy this requirement. 1. Conspiracy wanting 329. When it is alleged that the defendant class members conspired with each other that provides a basis for holding each conspirator liable to each plaintiff and solves the problem. 2. Juridical link wanting 330. The courts have also allowed bilateral class actions where there is a juridical link among the defendants. Usually this means that defendants are officers of the same governmental unit, such as the state. C. E.G. Marsara v. Chinlund. Supra action against sheriffs of state for denying contact visits to pretrial detainees. 